it for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line can hold it down shout out to my man sammy got it off the ground and to all the listeners tuned in right now got debates analysis and speculation this is sports talk for the new generation you know where to find us got a reputation sick podcast your number one sports destination giving all our devotion riding high on this wave of emotion going all out yeah cause this is our time no, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. Listen to the Sick Podcast with Tony Maradero. 55 seconds left in the penalty, a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time. Boston 4, Montreal 3. 
Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into the mayor back to Lafleur. Oh! The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> there is a bomb. Sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant, et c'est le bon You found the dogs! John, you found the dogs! He found the dogs! And all together they worked a young team to the top. And now a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup! Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La TV. It's gonna be sick. Marinaro on this Monday, May 8th. It is probably a couple of minutes to 8 p.m. I got on a little bit earlier. As a matter of fact, I got on much earlier because usually the sick podcast goes weeknights at 10 p.m. Eastern. But, of course, tonight is a very special night. It's one of the nights that we've all been waiting for, at least we hope, especially here in Montreal. Montreal Canadiens fans are waiting for this because the player that is set to go, number one overall, is what you call a generational player, a generational talent. He is Connor Bedard. The last time the Montreal Canadiens drafted an offensive superstar like a Connor Bedard, you have to go back to the 1971 draft. When they drafted Guy Lafleur, Guy Lafleur, Montreal has been craving for an offensive superstar. In previous years, they've had pretty good picks in terms of selection, that is. They had the number three pick in 2012. They drafted Alex Galchenyuk. They had the number three pick several years later. They drafted Jesperi Kakanyemi. They had the number one pick last year in a draft they were able to host. They drafted Uri Slavkowski. But this, once again, folks, is a generational talent courtesy of TV Aspal. And I want to bring up some stats that will compare Connor Bedard to Connor McDavid to Sidney Crosby, two other generational players. Take a look at that. Crosby, 66 goals in his last year, in his draft year. Connor McDavid, 44 goals. Connor Bedard, 71 goals. 168 points for Crosby, 120 for McDavid, 143 for Connor Bedard. Crosby had 2.71 points per game. McDavid had 2.55 points per game. Connor Bedard had 2.51 points per game. At just 17 years old at the World Junior Tournament, he was able to do something that no other player has ever done, Canadian player at the World Juniors. He scored more goals already with still two more years of eligibility to play in that tournament. He had picked up more points. This guy is in a class of his own. If all goes well and all goes according to plan and barring injury, what you see from Connor Bedard, what you see from Connor McDavid, you'll see from Connor Bedard or very close to it. He's that kind of talent, folks, so much so that we have to pull out all the stops. One year ago, we went to Maria Madre de Cristiani Church and we spoke with Father Don Bosco and asked him for a prayer. And he did so and he delivered and the Canadians won the lottery. We're not going to break something that works. One year later, I went back. With Father Don Bosco and Maria Madre de Cristiani Church in Villa Sal. Father, thank you for doing this. I'm back for a second time. I was here a year ago, and I ask that God hear our prayer and that the Montreal Canadiens win the draft lottery to get the number one pick overall. And God answered our prayers one year ago. We're hoping that one year later he will answer them again because the number one pick this year will be superstar Connor Bedard, which if the Montreal Canadiens can get the number one pick will be the greatest offensive superstar since the late, great Guy Lafleur, who left us just over a year ago. Father, can you do a prayer for us? Sure, why not? You trust in the Lord and you have come here. As you said last year, you won it. And this year we will again place it into the hands of the Lord, especially through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, where we are here at Mother of the Christian Church. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Lord, we are, you have asked us to pray to you with trust and faith. So we pray for NHL to, as they pick their draw, that you may be with them and help them to pick number one like last year you did. And we trust in you and we place our trust in you and ask you in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. For the Montreal, for the Montreal Canadiens to get the number one pick. All right? Of course. For the Montreal course. Canadiens? Of course, for the Montreal Canadiens to get number one pick. Because we want Connor Bedard. You want Connor Bedard, you trust in the Lord and he will grant you that. Thank you, Father. Welcome. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Welcome. Number one. There you go. We're pulling out all the stops. And once again, it's a special edition of the Sick Podcast on this Monday, May 8th, NHL Draft Lottery Night. We're going to find out in just a minute or two where the Montreal Canadiens will be selecting. And the Sick Podcast is brought to you in part by Energy Transportation Group, a leading full-service logistics provider serving all of North America, driven to be different, different like me. I'm Marinaro. Also brought to you in part by La Bit ATB. Brewed in Quebec, a winner of a dozen international awards, La Bit ATB offers quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone's taste. La Bit ATB, embrace your true nature. And also brought to you in part by XL Moto, the premier motorcycle and scooter dealership in Montreal for over 20 years. Their dealership carries seven different motorcycle and scooter brands. They are the number one Aprilia and Piaggio ambassadors for the last Five years, Excel Moto, your ultimate destination and best customer service experience. In my opinion, only one place in Montreal to buy a Piaggio and or a Vespa scooter. It is Excel Moto and ExcelMoto.com. Well, the balls are rolling right now. Let's give you some of the um, some of the draft rules. Also, courtesy of TV Aspar. Here we go. The draft rules. A team cannot improve their selection by more than 10 spots. Also, teams 12 to 16 cannot get the first pick overall. And the Ducks can end up getting the first pick, even losing out on the lottery. We'll explain all of that in just a second. Let's take a look at the percentages and the teams that have the best chances. All right, the Anaheim Ducks is at 18.5%. But you have to understand that there are two draws. There is going to be one draw for the top 11 and another draw for 12 to 16. If you actually add both up together, at that point, Anaheim is over 25%. Okay? Columbus, 13.5%. Chicago, 11.5%. San Jose, nine and a half, Montreal, eight and a half, Arizona, seven and a half, Philadelphia, six and a half, Washington, six, Detroit, five percent, St. Louis, three point five percent, Vancouver, three percent. Now, you're probably wondering, what are the chances of the Montreal Canadiens winning the lottery? A buddy of mine called me earlier today. He says, but I need to know teams that have the, an eight point five percent chance. Have they won the lottery? And the answer to that is in the modern era. Uh, not in the modern era, but in the modern era, it happened twice that I know of off the top of my head, the year that the Carolina Hurricanes drafted Zvechnikov with the second pick overall, they had the 11th worst record in the National Hockey League that year. So you think they'll draft 11, boom, they moved all the way down, they improved by uh, a bunch of spots, and they ended up having the second pick overall. Just one year ago, the New Jersey Devils were sitting in the exact same spot the Montreal Canadiens are sitting in now with the fifth worst record in hockey and an 8.5% chance at the number one pick overall. Unfortunately, they didn't get it. But what they did get 
is they got the number two pick overall. The number two pick overall. Not too shabby, huh? Not too shabby. All right. Over the next couple of hours, we're going to have several scouts who are going to join us who are going to tell us what their top 10 looks like. And so I'm going to tell you right now, the Kyle Woodleaf of the Redline Report and over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, maybe even more, every year that they have the draft, they reference the Redline Report a lot. Kyle Woodleaf is a former scout with the Nashville Predators, and he opened up his own scouting agency, Redline Report. Kyle, in person and on video, uh, has scouted about 170 games of this draft class. So he'll be able to give us some great opinions, no doubt. And also be able to give us the NHL side of it. What happens in the interviews? You know, what do they say? What do they talk about? What are teams looking at? Uh, How are they watching this NHL draft lottery? Uh, How many times have uh, scouting departments already met this year? How many times will they meet again? And the same thing goes for Grant McCagg, who he is also a former scout in the National Hockey League, a former scout for the Montreal Canadiens and the Bob during the Bob Ganey administration, of course. And Grant several years ago opened up his own independent scouting agency recruits and recruits.ca. And he watches just as many games. I mean, they all do. Whoever we're getting on is watching 150 plus games of this draft class and joining us a little later on after that, because if all goes well, um, Kyle Woodleaf will join us at around 8 30 PM or so. Grant McCagg will join us at around 9 p.m. or so. And Simo the Snake Boivide, who turned a few heads once he started blogging for my buddy Matthias Brunet many years ago. That earned him a scouting job with the Cape Breton Eagles of the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. And over the past couple of years, he's been a consultant for Les Farrar de Val d'Or. And he's BPM Spar's draft expert. He's on the air with them on the radio right now as we speak. And we are live right now on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter. It is the Sick Podcast. We're going to hear from all of these people. And to Agnello and Sammy at Master Control, if I say open up the phone lines, we open up the phone lines. And so jot the number down just in case already if you want to get a head start on things. But we're not taking calls right now. But it is toll free number one triple eight five eight five six one triple eight five eight five seven four two five. Um, Connor Bedard, and he's not the only one, folks. There are many. They're talking about the draft experts are talking about this year's draft as one of the deepest drafts in the history of the National Hockey League. I mean, it's being talked about in the same sentence as the 2003 NHL amateur draft. So although everyone wants that number one pick, I can tell you this, that in a draft this deep, the Montreal Canadiens are going to get some good players. Every team should be able to get good players. You remember that 2003 draft? Mark andre Fleury, number one to Pittsburgh. Carolina's Eric Stahl at number two. Nathan Horton went to Florida at number three. Zerdev to Columbus at four. Thomas Vanek to Buffalo at five. Uh, Milan Mihailik went to San Jose at six. Ryan Suter went to Nashville at seven. Braden Colburn went to Atlanta at eight. Dion Phaneuf went to Calgary at nine. Yeah, the Montreal Canadiens selected Andre Kostitsin at number 10. Philadelphia went with Jeff Carter. Mm, That hurts. At number 11. That hurts for the Canadians, that is. Hugh Jessamine, that hurt even more for the New York Rangers. He only played two NHL games. He went number 12. Dustin Brown, 13th to Los Angeles. Brent Seabrook, 14th to Chicago. Robert Nielsen uh, went 15th to the Islanders. Steve Bernier, 16th to San Jose. Zach Parise, 17th to New Jersey. And then Eric Fear, Ryan Getzlaff, Brent Burns, Mark Stewart, Marc-Antoine Pouliot, um, Ryan Kessler, Mike Richards, Anthony Stewart, Brian Boyle, Jeff Tambellini, Corey Perry, Patrick Eves, and Sean Bell. Those were the 30 picks in round one. And it should be noted that Louis Erickson went 33rd uh, to the Dallas Stars, of course. And this one hurts as well. 
the Montreal Canadiens selected Corey Urquhart with the 40th pick overall. And the player that, in my opinion, ended up being the best player from this draft class, Patrice Bergeron, went 45th to the Boston Bruins. And not too shabby, Nashville drafting Shea Weber with the 49th pick overall. So this draft class of 2023... Uh, which is the uh, 2005 draft class, but in the year 2023, is as deep as, of course, uh, the draft was back in 2003. It's that deep when the players, of course, were, uh, what were they? They were the uh, 1984 draft class. It is that deep. The difference being, of course, is that there was no consensus number one forward superstar back in the day, and there is today. With the 16th pick overall, here's Bill Daly. Pick number 16. Live reaction right now on the Sick Podcast. Calgary Flames, you're poop out of luck. You're drafting 16th. All right. Calgary with 16. Let's go. Let's go. 15. 15, 15. The Nashville Predators with the 15th pick. David Poyle is smiling. That's a fake smile. 14th pick. The 14th pick is the Pittsburgh Penguins. By the way, reminding all of you that if the Montreal Canadiens drop in terms of getting a worse pick, they can only drop two spots. So at worst, they're getting seventh. At best, they're getting first. Let's go. Pick 13. The Buffalo Sabres would pick 13. Pick 12. Once again, Calgary 16, Nashville 15, Pittsburgh 14, Buffalo 13. Pick 12. The Ottawa Senators have the 12th pick. Ottawa Senators with the 12th pick. The pre-draft order now for the top 11. We'll get to it in a second. The 11th pick. The Vancouver Canucks have pick number 11. The 10th pick. The 10th pick is the St. Louis Blues. So St. Louis and Vancouver actually didn't move from 10 to 11. That was the pre-draft order, and that's where they selected. Ninth. The Detroit Red Wings. Which was also their pre-draft order. Number eight. The Washington Capitals. It can't be seven for the Canadians. It can't be seven for the Canadians. It can't be seven for the Canadians. No, not seven. 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 No. The Philadelphia Flyers, seventh pick. Six is next. No, it can't be the Canadians. 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 The Arizona Coyotes, sixth. Arizona at six. Wow. Number five. No, it cannot be the Canadians. 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 No, please, God. No, it can't be the Canadians. Please, no. Please, no. No, no. Oh, no. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Damn you. And all those stupid games that you won this season. 
damn you and all those stupid games that you won when you shouldn't have won and injured players playing through injury and trying to play damn you damn you san jose fourth oh my god oh my god oh this is a sad day it's a sad day in the history of the much fucking idiots i can't take anymore oh my god oh my god oh my god oh oh this is a sad day this is a sad day all the games that you won for the Montreal Canadian Samuel Montembeau. All the games that you won for the Montreal Canadian Samuel Montembeau. All those games where all those fans, all those fans, the Canadians were scoring goals and they were celebrating. Hey, hey, hey baby. Dis-moi ce qu'il faut. Energie cardio. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. They were cheering after every win. I was crying after every win. They were cheering. I was crying. They were cheering. I was crying. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, oh I don't feel good. Oh, I think I'm going to be sick. I think I'm going to be sick. I think I'm going to be sick. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I think I'm going to be sick. I think I'm going to be sick. We tried to pull out all the stops. God probably said, I answered your prayers a year ago. I can't answer them one year later. I can't answer them one year later. I'm not blaming you, God. I love you, God. I love you. And I thank you that they didn't pick seventh. And I thank you that they didn't pick sixth. But fifth, oh my God, man. Ah, uh, fifth. Ah, uh, fifth. Oh, man. Oh, man. One lucky team is going to get Connor Bedard, and it's not going to be the Montreal Canadiens. Oh. oh, I feel like breaking away now and coming back at 10 o'clock or scheduled time. But I'm not going to do that because you're a lot of you that are watching live on YouTube live, watching on Facebook live and watching on Twitter live. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's absolutely free. Tell your friends about it. Tell them to tune in now. If they want to see me in one of the worst moods I've ever been in, I am dejected. I'm demoralized. I'm distraught. Uh, this is worse than not going home with the prom queen. This is terrible. This is terrible. This is going to the prom and not going home with the prom queen. And uh, if you're not going to come home with the prom queen, you might as well not go to the prom at all. And I feel that this is, oh, my God. Oh, my God. All those stupid games that they won. All those stupid games. <sighs> they were tying games up with 30 seconds left in the game, a minute left in the game, taking the game to overtime, picking up a point, a wasted point. Oh, this guy has the chance to be the next Connor McDavid. And we're watching the playoffs, and we're watching Connor and Leon, one that was drafted first and one that was drafted third carry the team on their back, both of them, both of them, saying to their teammates, get on my back, I'll carry you. And now the Canadians had a chance at number one. They had a chance at number two. And here they are with the fifth pick overall. And now you have to hope. You have to hope that some players just don't end up having the kind of career that was projected for them. McDavid looks like a slam dunk. And the Montreal Canadiens, uh, I didn't want five. I didn't want five. You know, I didn't want five. I'm not going to lie to you. I wanted number one. And if they weren't going to get number one, I wanted number two. Oh, my God. This has ruined my night. May 8th, 2023. One of the worst nights in the history of my life already. San Jose with the fourth pick overall. Chicago, Columbus, and Anaheim are the three that have a chance at number one. With the third pick, the Columbus Blue Jackets. And Yarmo Kekalainen and John Davidson look like they are distraught. They're not hiding their emotions. It's either Anaheim or Chicago. 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 I don't want either of them to get it. 
maybe Chicago a little bit more for our buddy uh, Luke Richardson. The number one pick. Connor Bedard is going to the Chicago Blackhawks. Anaheim gets the second pick. Look at Kyle Davidson. Look how excited he is. Look at them. They're going nuts in Chicago. They're going nuts. Okay. They did everything to tank. Make no mistake, they did everything to tank. They traded Alex DeBrinket. They got Patate Chipol in return. They traded Kirby Doc to the Montreal Canadiens. For a peanuts, they got. They weakened their team. Before the deadline, they traded Patrick Kane. Go. Go to New York. Let's lose as many games as possible. Because if we do, we're going to give ourselves a solid shot of winning the lottery and getting Connor Bedard. Connor Bedard is a better talent than Patrick Kane was at his age in his draft year when he went number one overall. He's a better talent than Jonathan Taves is when he went number three in his draft year. Those two players led the Chicago Blackhawks to three Stanley Cups. Three! And now they have Connor Bedard. And guess what? He's going to win a Stanley Cup with the Chicago Blackhawks. Folks, he might even win two Stanley Cups. Or he might even take a page out of Kane and Taves' book. And he might win three Stanley Cups. They weakened their team. They made tra trades where people watching were saying, ah, oh, they could have got a lot more than that. They're stupid. No, they're smart. We're stupid. They're smart. Everyone else is stupid. They're smarter than everyone else. Reminds me of the Maple Leafs. When they, uh, when they traded Kessel, they traded Fanaf. They got weaker. Yeah, yeah. We want to be bad for a couple of years. Austin Matthews at number one. Mitch Marner at number four. Have they won the cup yet? No. As a matter of fact, they're on the verge of getting bounced. But you know what? At least you have exciting hockey. At least you have entertaining hockey. Only one team can win the cup at the end of the year. Mind you, their time in Toronto is not over yet. They can still do it. Doesn't look good for this year, but they can still do it. But at least you get entertaining hockey. You get a guy who takes you out of your seats. You have a guy who scores 50, 55 goals. You have a couple of players who pick up 100 points. They're smart. They're not dumb. They're smart. Chicago is getting Connor Bedard. Chicago's getting Connor Bedard. My God. I'm distraught. I am absolutely distraught. Some will say they cheated the system. Others will say they outsmarted the system. They outsmarted the system. We thought we were, we, we thought we were, a lot of people thought we were smart to winning culture. No, no, let's get, we got to get, we got to get better. We got to, we got to establish a culture. You know, all the people, all the fans watching right now, millions and millions of people all over the world watching the sick podcast with me, no, no, me, all those fans that talked about, we have to create a winning culture. It's bad if they lose all the time because after all, being the worst team in the National Hockey League doesn't guarantee you the number one pick. No, it didn't. It gave the worst team in the National Hockey League the number two pick, and it gave the second worst team in the National Hockey League the number one pick or the third worst team. Where were they? I, I'm so, I'm so, I'm, I'm rattled right now. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? I am rattled. Sono un po' distrutto. I'm distraught. Columbus finished with the second worst record. 
They were tied with Chicago, but they had one less win. So the team with the third worst record got the number one pick. The team with the worst record got the number two pick. But no, us, we want to, we have, we have to build a winning culture. It's important. It's important. It's going to help us in three years from now, four years from now. Connor Bedard would help us in three years from now, four years from now. Heck, he would help us next year. They would have got Connor Bedard. You don't have to rebuild. The rebuild is over. It's over. You could start adding elements to the team now. Add a free agent if you want. Go out, make a move or two. You can even patch a little bit here and there. You're set. You're set. Now, we don't have Connor Bedard. As a matter of fact, with the fifth pick overall, we don't even know if that player is going to play in the National Hockey League this year. We don't even know if that player is going to play in the National Hockey League next year. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Who knows? Wow. So why don't we do this now? Let, let, let the Pierre-Luc Dubois talk begin now. They had stopped for a couple of days. Now they're going to start again. Give him for Dubois. Give him. Give him. Give him. Give him. On donne lui, on donne lui, mais oui, on est, puis look, à la maison, pipipa, pipipi, pipipa. Alexis, Alexis, on va rechercher Alexis aussi, les Rangers, OK, let's go get him, let's go get him. On échange notre choix, on échange le 5, on échange le 20 quelques, on échange lui, hein. give up this defenseman, that defenseman, this prospect, that's prospect, that's it. That's it. Let's go out, you know, let's, let's, let's take guys from other teams who haven't had success yet in their National Hockey League careers. Mind you, it's still a young career. One is three years in. The other one is six years in. You know, S struggled with consistency. Let's go out now. Let's give up the farm to go out and get those guys. Why? Because, yeah, you know what? We had to pick up a few points here and there. And they were, they were, they were, they were jumping up and down at the Bell Center, you know, 21,000, whatever it is. I even forget the number now, which is a solo capacity, right? They were jumping up and down. They were jumping. They were clapping. The camera would zoom in on the husband and wife. They'd give a kiss. Two buddies who had a couple of pops. Yeah, yeah. They were saying, we, 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 oh, we, oh, we, Canadien, we, we, on a gagné, we, c'est correct, oh, we, 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 on va pas faire des séries, mais c'est correct, on a gagné le match, oh, we, oh, we, nobody, nobody thinking that this every point they were picking up was just hurting them but me there's a couple of others too but all of you all of you that went to the bell center and were jumping up and down after they scored the goal and this and that and some of you wanted to be the pump fan of the game if they even have it i don't even know anymore the others one with the drums i don't even know if they do that anymore winning the car race jumping up and down the goal this that whatever uh, with tying games going overtime winning games going up and down starting the wave whatever you did whatever brought you uh, some sort of happiness my uh, my question for you now right now is was it worth it? Damn you. Damn all of you for being happy when they were picking up points. Was it worth it? You know, in French, they say, poser la question, c'est répondre. Asking the question is answering it. Of course, it's not worth it. Of course. We bring in. I'm distraught. Oh my God, I'm distraught. Former. National, national. I'm rattled. I'm rattled. Former scout with the Nashville Predators. He runs his own independent scouting agency called the Redline Report. Kyle Woodleaf. Kyle, what's going on? Hey there, Tony. Well, I'm uh, I'm happy to be joining you for the first time uh, when you're at your most calm and relaxed self that I've ever seen you. Yeah, a little bit of sarcasm, I know, but uh, I deserve it, I guess, uh, Kyle. I had this ready. I was, you know what? I I, I, I had the foghorn, which I'm not <laughs> going to make it go off right now because, you know, my wife, I already wake up every day thinking she's going to leave me. And if I do this, she really will. And uh, that would cost me a lot of money. We don't want that. Um, I, I'm distraught. K Kyle, okay. So I'm going to ask you something, which is going to hurt. And I'm going to ask it anyway. And I don't even know why I'm asking it. You've seen everyone, Kyle. 
How good is Connor Bedard? Well, I mean, he's he's what he was touted to be. He's the best prospect to come along since Connor McDavid in in 2015. Yes. So, you know, he is he is the best prospect that I've graded since Connor Connor McDavid. I had McDavid yeah. a little higher than him as a prospect simply because McDavid was bigger, stronger, and faster. Yeah, um, and can do all the things that Bedard does. So, I wouldn't put him quite on the stratosphere of uh, of McDavid. But he's the best prospect to come along since McDavid. The best prospect since McDavid. So you would put him half a notch to one notch below. Yeah. Half notch. A half notch below Connor McDavid. Yeah. So we watch Connor McDavid every night do his thing. Uh, and we would say that if he would drop his play by five to ten percent, ninety percent to ninety-five percent. Of Connor McDavid is what you foresee for Connor Bedard. Well, I'm just saying that at the age of 18, he's he's 95, 90 to 95 percent of the prospect that McDavid was. When they're all prospects, you don't know how they're going to turn out. I mean, there's been plenty of number one overall picks that never panned out. So, yeah, I don't, you I think don't a- think that's going to happen with Bedard, but yeah, I understand same- that. If you take a look at the guys that are touted to go number two, number three, number four, number five, uh, Connor Bedard on the other side of the street whistling to them saying, guys, I'm over here, or not that much. Well, uh, personally, I think Matvey Michkov is the second best prospect to come along since the advent of Connor McDavid. So, you know, uh, I have... Bedard in, in the top tier all by himself. I have Mitch Goff in the second tier all by himself. And I would say that he's closer to Connor Bedard in the first tier than he is to Leo Carlson and Adam Fantilli in the third tier. All right. Let's take a look at your picks, if you can, because I asked you for your top 10 picks as of today, Monday, May 8th. And these are your top 10 picks. We also have Grant McCagg's top 10 picks and Simo the Snake Boisvert. Both those gentlemen will be joining us a little bit later or be joining me a little bit later on the SICK podcast. Bedard, number one, of course, across the board. No surprise there. You and Simo the Snake Boisvert both have Michkov at number two. Grant McCagg has Michkov at number nine. That's interesting. All right. Um, Michkov. There's a chance that he'll be available at five when the Montreal Canadiens pick because even though he is an amazing pure talent, and there's a chance that he isn't, by the way, of course, with everything going on in Russia, um, with the fact that he's going to be under contract in the KHL for several more seasons, The fact that the uncertainty of coming over to the National Hockey League, personally, it doesn't bother me that much, and I take the chance. But he's a player that might scare off a few teams. I know you have him at two, but does your gut tell you he's going to two, or do you think he's sliding? I don't think he'll go at two, but I think the team that picks second overall and doesn't take him will be making a mistake. I'll, I'll answer, I'll answer your question with a series of questions of my own. In the 2004 draft, Washington took Alex Ovechkin first overall. And Pittsburgh took Malkin. And Pittsburgh picked Malkin. Most people don't realize or don't remember 19 years later now, Ovechkin didn't come to play in the NHL his first year after the draft, Washington had to wait a year for him. Do you think they mind having to wait a year, you know, now that his career has played out? No. Evgeny Malkin spent two more years in Russia, didn't come over till the age of 20. And do you think Pittsburgh minds that they didn't get him for his age 18 and 19 years now? Uh, I I don't think they do. And there's plenty more like that. I mean, do you think uh, Minnesota – is bothered by the fact that they had to wait three years or four years for Kirill Kaprizov. Doubtful. 
you know, Tarasenko was a top three overall talent in his draft year. I think St. Louis managed to get him around 15 or 16. They had to wait a couple of years. Do you think they minded, you know, when, when his career played out the way it did, do you think they minded? Let, let's do this. Uh, interesting points that you bring up. Let's bring back up the, uh, the chart with everyone's top 10. All right. So let's take a look at your top 10. And let's take a look specifically at number five, Will Smith. You have, yes. Which, by the way, same thing as Simon the Snake Boisvert has him at number five. So, my question to you is: Let's just say it takes Michkov three years to come over. Will Will Smith, in your opinion, play in the National Hockey League in the next two years? Yes, I think he will. You know- okay. He'll take a year in college, I believe, but I think by the second year, he'll be playing in the NHL. All right. One more year, a year in college and, and playing in the NHL. Okay. Because if you would have said no, then you can say, all right, okay. So if it takes, uh, if it takes Michkov three years to come over, well, if it's going to take another player, that's going to take three years for them to make the NHL, then you're not really losing anything. Right. But if it takes Michkov three years to come over, and you take him instead of Will Smith, well, Will Smith probably would make the National Hockey League in two years. Now, once again, that's just your opinion. Anything can happen, but obviously I appreciate the opinion very much. Wow, okay. So, um, Michkov. Can you be able to put into words what he's done in the KHL? Well, I mean, he's just an electric talent. Yeah, he's one of the best pure natural goal scorers to come along in the last 12 to 15 years. I mean, he's right up there in the same category from a strictly just a goal scoring standpoint. He's up there with the McDavid's and the Austin Matthews and uh, and and those, you know, players of that ilk. Um his his shooting talent is off the charts, his ability to get himself open in scoring territory at just the right moment off the charts, his hockey sense, his offensive instincts, his hands, uh, it's, it's all, it's all top, top level. So, you know, uh, okay. He has a contract that runs a few more years. There's not to say that the Canadians or whatever team would draft him. Couldn't get him out of that contract a little early. I mean, you know, with the way things are over in Russia, I don't think the NHL is, uh, you know, is looking at, Contracts in the KHL as being ironclad, you know, the, the whole agreement between the KHL and, uh, and the NHL, you know, things are, things are on hold. So the, if, the Anaheim if, Ducks, Kyle, have the second pick in the draft. Yeah. If you were working for the Anaheim Ducks, or you don't even have to work for the Anaheim Ducks, let's just say, um, you know, several teams use your scouting service as a reference, but let's just say a team wanted to give you a call and say, Hey Kyle. Yeah. It's the Anaheim ducks. Hey, how you doing? We're doing good. Great. great. Kyle, we got the number two pick. Do you think we should draft Michkov? You would say yes, but they would say, they would say, but you know what? Why take a chance? Why risk it? When we can draft Carlson, or we can draft Fantilli, or we can draft Smith. You would say what? When they bring up those names and say, why would we risk it? Why don't we just go with the safe picks? We can either draft Carlson, Fantilli, or Smith. You would say what? Mishkov has proven over and over again internationally that he's a guy who comes up big at the biggest moments. I mean, he's a guy who can put you over the top. You know, if you're Anaheim or whoever drafting second, third, are you really looking at being a playoff team next year? Or do you think you're, do you think you're going to go from the 31st record in the league to being in the top 16 in one year? No, if anything, you wouldn't mind staying bad. So if a player can't join your team next year, it's probably a win. It's not a bad thing. I mean, you're you're missing out on one year of his career in a season where you're not expecting to do much anyway. So, you know, where where is the real benefit? He's he's still playing against men in the KHL. He's still learning his craft, getting better as an all-around player. 
there's not a huge downside to it unless you really think that you're never going to be able to get him out of Russia. And I don't think that's the case. Players are still leaving Russia to come over and play in the NHL. Yeah, it's the National Hockey League is the best hockey league in the world. Um, you know, you you wonder about the the Nick Bobrov and how much you would like. And of course, I'm catering to a Montreal Canadiens fan base for the most part here, uh, who want to want to see who the Montreal Canadiens are going to end up drafting on Wednesday, June 28th. And we know now, folks, they're the fifth worst record in hockey, and their selection didn't get any worse. It didn't get any better. They will be drafting fifth overall. All right, you talked to me about Bedard. You talked to me about Michkov. You got uh, Leo Carlson, number three, on your list. Tell me why. Big, strong, physical center, already competing against men in Sweden and coming out on top in all the board battles against guys 10, 12 years older than he is. Uh, you know, again, a, a team leader, a captain material type, a guy who's going to be really strong down the center of the ice. He dominates the middle of the ice. So, you know, he's a guy that at 6'3", he'll play at 210 pounds in the NHL, and he's just going to dominate the middle. Um, you know, he's going to make his wingers better every night. He's going to compete his bag off every night. Yeah, for the benefit of uh, those who are uh, who are watching, of course, uh, and listening in, uh, why don't we can, we'll also give their positions, all right? Bedard, let's start with him. We know he was touted as a center, and then in the last year is more so touted as a right winger, as a guy who can shoot and score goals. Uh, you see him in the National Hockey League more as a center or a right, a right winger? I would prefer to see him on the wing. Uh, I think if you put him with a creative centerman, you know, the, the, the sky is the ceiling for him. I mean, you know, if you get him with a talented, creative, inventive center who can put him in, in good positions with the puck, you know, he's a 50 to 60 goal man. Mave Michkov, a uh, left-handed shot who likes to play more so on the off wing. Yes. As, as with most Europeans, uh, he plays the off wing. Um, again, you know, he'll be a winger in the NHL. He's not a center. Uh, he's a smallish winger, uh, ultra, ultra skilled. And again, there's potential there for him to be a 50 goal scorer in the NHL. And you, you don't say that about too many prospects coming out at the age of 18. Yeah. And where do you stand in terms of size nowadays compared to previous years when we're talking about a five foot 10 uh, winger? Where do you stand on that? Well, it's funny. I was uh, for many years thought to be behind the curve because I always had a bias for the good little man in the game. And uh, for many years, I would rank players who were smaller, much higher than NHL teams would take them. And, uh, and now we've come full circle. I'm glad to see that the, the the little man has a place in the game again. And I think increasingly the lack of size it doesn't, it doesn't really matter much. Look at what Lane Hudson is expected to do when he hits the NHL. Look what Kale McCarr has already done. Quinn Hughes. I mean, yes, they're defensive. Hold on. We need, we, need, we need a little bit of excitement right now in Montreal. We need a little bit of excitement. Get us excited about Lane Hudson. Get us excited. Well, my line in the in Red Line Reports draft guide on him last year was that if you add two inches and 20 pounds, he's a top three overall pick in the draft. Wow. Wow. So I, I wrote that before last year's draft, and I said, you know, he's a first-round talent all day, every day. Um, you know, he's he was literally our favorite player to watch in the draft last year. Wow. Amazing. And guess what? He added two inches and over 20 pounds since then. Did he not? Yeah. Well, I don't know if he's added 20 pounds yet, but he's, he's closing in on 510. Yeah. Well, he's, if he's off for the summer, he could come eat at my house. He'll, he'll add 20 pounds in three weeks. <laughs> the all pasta diet. Uh, you're right about that one. Yes. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, at least we got something to be excited about here. Kyle Woodley, formerly with the Nashville Predators, Owner and scout for the Red Line Report, a reference point for NHL teams for how many years now? 30 years. 30 years says that last year you said if Lane Hudson would have been two inches taller and 20 pounds heavier, he's a top three pick in the draft. Wow. Right. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Now I'm excited, at least, about that.
at least. <laughs> All right. Um, Leo Carlson. Yeah. Center. Yeah, he can play on the wing. I've seen him play left wing. Uh, but I would prefer to see him as a center in the NHL. I mean, he's a he's a man. He dominates the middle of the ice. Uh, I just think he's he's a natural center. Adam Fantilli, at one point early on in the season, many thought that he can challenge Connor Bedard. Some thought that at one point he was probably even number one. Was he ever number one on your list a month into the season? Two months at any point ever? No, no, never he- number one. For two months, he was at number three. Uh, and then after the World Juniors, we flipped Carlson ahead of him a game. All right. Uh, I want to go back to Michkov for a second because now my infatuation is going to be Michkov over the next couple of months. But I have to tell you, I I just I don't think he's going to fall in the Montreal Canadiens' lap. And as a matter of fact, even if he does, I think they might end up passing on him. I, I, I just, I got this feeling. But I mean, I, I don't know. Who knows? But... If we go back several years and we talked about, you know, 2005 born players or 2004 born players, we talked about the 2023 draft and we projected. Was Michkov at one point your number one a couple of years ago? He was at least one or one A. I mean, he was right there with Bedard. When, when we were all down in Texas for the 2021 World Under 18 Championship, Coming yeah. out, coming out of a really down year where COVID affected things dramatically. Yeah, and th- those two guys were like double underagers competing at the World Under 18 Championships. Uh-huh. As great as Bedard was there, Mishkov was better. I mean, Mishkov scored, wow. I believe, if I remember correctly, I think Mishkov had 14 goals in seven games in that tournament. Pasando, Donuello. Wow. So. You're, you're not really talking about a consolation prize. Uh, I, I just wrote in Redline Report today, as a matter of fact, that yeah. I would have Leachkoff, if I go back in time over the last 13 drafts, Yeah, he, he would be number one overall in the rankings for at least 11 of the last 13 drafts. And he wouldn't be for which two drafts? McDavid and Bedard. Wow. So we're talking about a talent, in your opinion, based on what you've seen thus far. And by the way, your job is unbelievably hard. Um, but right now, because uh, obviously we're not talking about projecting, but you were talking about right now, based on what you see, um, we're talking about a talent superior to that of Nathan McKinnon in his draft year. Yeah, I would have McKinnon and Matthews you know, right in that tier along with Mishkov, but behind McDavid and, and Bedard. And that really says a lot about how you think about Michkov. Because as we know, Kyle, right? When it comes to uh, rankings, uh, players who don't play center actually aren't um, touted as high as they would be, right? If you play center, all things being equal, if you have a centerman and and a winger who scouts will say, you know what, identical talents, the center will always... Uh, that'll carry more weight. Yeah, there there is a positional value there. I mean, the NHL centers rule. I mean, if you look at teams that win the Stanley Cup every year, they're strong down the middle. And because of that, or or even not notwithstanding, if you have the second pick overall in the draft, Carlson is a center, Fantilli's a center, and there are others, but you go with Mishkov, who's a winger. Wow. Yeah, because Mishkov's talent level is a, is a notch higher than theirs. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. All right, okay, let's get to some other picks. Um, talk to me about Will Smith. Um, I mean, he's a premier offensive talent. At number yeah. five, you're going to get a premier offensive talent if you want one. Yeah. I mean, Will Smith, obviously, just uh, MVP of the World Under-18s over in Switzerland last week. Um, yeah. Yeah. Nine goals, 19 points in seven games. Um, you know, he's a game breaker. He's an absolute yeah. game breaker. Terrific skater. Anytime he steps on the ice, it's a scoring opportunity. He's, yeah. You know, he's he's going to be a top scoring center in the league, and he is a natural center. I project him to 
remain at center in the NHL. He does. The reason he's behind players like Carlson and Fantilli is he does need to work more on the details of his game. Away from the puck, he's he's not as strong. Uh, he's not as big physically. He's not as strong physically. And his details away from the puck are not as complete. All right. Okay. Uh, by the way, it should be noted for everyone watching right now, live on YouTube, live on Facebook, and live on Twitter, we are The Sick Podcast. Tell your friends about it. Share it with your friends. If you're enjoying it, comment SICK, S-I-C-K, S-I-C-K, S-I-C-K. And if at some point you go on Spotify, Apple, uh, or Google Podcast, maybe tomorrow and you want to listen to it, give us a five-star review, uh, of course, because that's our way of feeling the love. We very much appreciate it. For those who are wondering, by the way, uh, important to note, if you put any bearing in this, um, Kent Hughes's former agency firm, Cortex Management, they represent Will Smith. All right. So, uh, you know, and we know that Kent used to coach Will Smith. So we know that Kent knows him very well. So uh, if he ends up selecting Will Smith, it's because he knows everything about him. And if he doesn't end up selecting Will Smith and he's available, well, it's because he knows everything about him. I mean, that, that, that's it. But, uh, wow. He certainly has unique insight into Smith. And, you know, they've, they've done all their research there. Yeah. They know everything there is to know about that player. And as yeah. you just put it very succinctly, if they select him, it's because they know everything about him. If they don't select him, it's because they know everything about him. All right. Uh, the under 18, of course, it's well documented. He was absolutely unbelievable. Uh, did you have a chance to watch it live? Yeah. Yeah, I was there in the in the early stages of the of the tournament. All right, okay. So when you saw him, where was he on your list before that tournament? Because obviously he could have only improved in your rankings. He couldn't have dropped. He was the best player in the tournament. Yeah, he was sixth going in and fifth coming out. Wow. Okay. Um, not enough to get into the uh, into the top four then. Eh, going from sixth to fifth, eh? No, and again, for the for the reasons that I just mentioned, uh, he's not as big or as strong as Carlson and Fantilli in the three four slots, um, and his details away from the puck aren't as uh, aren't as complete as they really need to be at this point. So he's not a two hundred foot player, in your opinion? Yet, just yet. He's it's so tough. I mean, he's got the puck on his stick so often that he he hasn't had to really work on his complete overall game in all three zones. Uh, I, you know, I think he can do it, but, you know, he's not as close to being a complete player as the other two are yet. All right. Um, tell me a little bit about Sandine Peleka. Yeah, he's uh, he's a tremendous puck-moving defenseman. I mean, this guy is going to run a top power play in the NHL when he gets there. He's a tremendous skater, uh, awfully smooth. He's uh, – he, he reminds me a little bit of Lane Hudson last year in that he's always using head feints and shoulder fakes to uh, to shake himself free. Again, he's not a big guy, about 5'11", 180 pounds, uh, but he will muck it up in the corners. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll use the body. He's not afraid to take hits or give hits to make plays. Um, you know, he's a, he's a true first pairing defenseman and um, maybe – uh, he he may be the only one, the only defenseman I would say that about in this year's draft. Wow. Uh, Benson put up unbelievable numbers in the WHL too, right? I mean, this guy can score goals. This guy can put up points. Benson is another, you know, extremely talented, highly, highly skilled forward. Um, his, uh, you know, he's, he's right in the mix with Pelika and, uh, and Smith for that five, six, seven grouping. Yeah. Uh, I would say that Benson is a little smaller. He's only about 5'9", 163 pounds at this point. So smaller player, the smallest player we've discussed so far in the top seven. Um, not as physical, but again, his, his hockey sense is just off the charts. His IQ. Would you, would you compare him to Cole Caulfield? Uh, no, I, I would say Caulfield was more of a shooter. I mean, yeah. this kid, this kid is more of a playmaker. He gets everybody yeah. involved. He's, uh, he's tremendous, tremendously imaginative with the puck on his stick, sees yeah. the whole place. Whereas Caulfield was a pure shooter. And, you know, when, when Caulfield was coming up on that U S team, he had Hughes as his center and Hughes was the guy getting him the puck all the time. And he just had to shoot. 
All right. Okay. Uh, a couple more and we'll get to them. Um, Barlow. Barlow is a prototypical winger in the NHL. I mean, he's a guy who's, who's got a big shot. He's got a great one-timer on the power play. Uh, he bulls his way to the net. He's got really good size and he's rugged in the corners. And, you know, he's going to be a 30 to 35 goal scorer in the NHL. Prototypical power winger. Matthew Wood. Matthew Wood, uh, he really raised his stock. Uh, he, he started out as a top five in our in our uh, rankings, or top six, I think, in our rankings last August before the season started. Dropped a little bit because of our concerns about his uh, his skating. But here's the thing. Uh, he, and, he and Bedard are childhood friends. They work out together all summer. And I have a scout out in Western Canada who knows Wood really well, said about two years ago, this kid was five foot six. He's mm -hmm. now six foot three. So he's wow. grown nine inches in just over two years, maybe two and a half years. Wow. His body and his leg strength hasn't caught up yet. I think his stride is okay. He just doesn't have the leg strength at this point. And I think when he acquires a little bit more leg strength, it may take him a little longer. It may take him two years to really reach the NHL, but he's got really big upside. I mean, everybody saw what he did for Team Canada at the World Under 18s. I mean, he was a dominant force on their top line. He and Celebrini together dominated their shifts. Yeah, and uh, Dalibor Dvorsky, I have to tell you, uh, much talked about, of course. Uh, he's a Slovak. He's a big boy, too, center. Uh, could play a 200-foot game. But when I saw him at the World Juniors, I wonder about his ability to be able to produce points. But that was not an issue at the Under 18s, was it? No, I, you know, again, it's it's the first time I think all season that he was playing against his own age group. I mean, he's mostly playing against men in Sweden uh, for the last two years. He, you know, he left Slo Slovakia early uh, at 16 and went over to Sweden, was playing against men there at least half the season. Uh, and again, you know, it's uh, going to the World Juniors with a, with a Slovak team that doesn't have a lot of offensive talent on it. They compete really hard. That was a good Slovak team. Uh, but they don't have a whole lot of offensive talent surrounding him to help him out. So everybody keyed on Dvorsky at the World Juniors. You know, at the World Under-18s, uh, I think he had seven goals and put up about 13 points. Um, he's a truck out there, and he's, an, again, a natural center with big size who can dominate in the middle. The question mark about him, again, is the acceleration and the top-end gear is missing. All right. Uh, you probably didn't expect this question from me, but in ending, I'm going to ask you this. Are you ready? Because this is what the talk is in Montreal, right? This is what the talk is in Montreal. That Pierre-Luc Dubois wants to come play for his hometown team. He's RFA at the end of the year. He's let it known that or, you know, people close to him have uh, let it be known to everyone that he wants to play for the Montreal Canadiens. And we're hearing that the Montreal Canadiens are interested. They have been ever since it was his draft year under a previous administration and a previous director of amateur scouting. Trevor Timmons was uh, very, very high on Pierre-Luc Dubois the year that he went third, of course, to the Columbus Blue Jackets. Um, and uh, Mark Bergevin was very, very high on him as well. The Canadians actually wanted to work out a deal with the Edmonton Orders for P.K. Subban and they were hoping to acquire the fourth pick overall because they were convinced that Dubois was going to be available at four. As it turned out, he wasn't available at four. He went number three. Um, would you acquire Pierre-Luc Dubois if you're the Montreal Canadiens? No. Flat out, no. Why not? To this point, after six seasons, he's been a career underachiever for his talent level. He's never scored more than 28 goals in the NHL. He's never scored more than 62 points in the NHL. He's been a focal point of the offense, uh, both in Columbus and in Winnipeg. He's never seemingly satisfied with his situation. And for a team that talked all season this year, and, and as soon as Jeff Gordon and Kent Hughes came on board about establishing culture, I don't think that's the culture you want to establish. Kyle Woodleaf of the Red Line Report. You and I, we go back a long time, ever since I was working on the radio. Always enjoyed my uh, my discussions with you. And you know what I love about you, Kyle? Um, you're always going to get an opinion. 
uh, it's uh, it's you know it's 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 not black and white with you. It's either black or white. I get an opinion, and that's what I love about you. And the first time that you're joining me right here on the Sick Podcast, and I hope it's going to be the first of many. I look forward to talking to you again, leading up to the draft and in ending. <clears throat> when was the last time you saw Michkov? In person? Yeah. Last season. This year, I've only seen him on video. All right. And when you saw him last season in person and you left the rink, you said what? Wow. (laughs) He's just electric. Wow. Amazing stuff. Thanks so much, Kyle. We'll talk to you soon. You got it, Tony. Thank you very much. There you have it, Kyle Woodleaf of the uh, Red Line Report. Uh, from Kyle, who's a former scout with the Nashville Predators and, of course, the owner of the Red Line Report, on to another former NHL scout. He was a former scout with the Montreal Canadiens during the Bob Ganey administration, and now he runs his own independent scouting service, Recruits, and recruits.ca is the website. Grant McCagg. Good evening, Grant. Hey, Tony. That close, eh? Uh, it was... Uh... Did, did it not remind you of the Crosby draft when we were last five and you thought, you know, okay... Uh, you know, we're in the fu- we're in the hunt, we're in the last five, and then uh, you know, right away with the Crosby. Remember, they took the break, yeah. And uh, you know, thought, oh, we could get Crosby, and then uh, number five picked Montreal, and it's the exact same this this time around. So, well, you know, a little disappointing there because you start to you start to get hope that you know maybe just maybe uh, the cards are going to fall their way again. Yeah, I hear you. I, I, what a downer, man. What a downer. What a downer. All right. Uh, you heard from Kyle. And I'd like to bring up the chart because uh, earlier this evening, I asked you for your top 10. If you were drafting, who would you draft top 10? I asked Kyle the same thing. And I asked Simo the Snake Boisvert, who's going to join us in about 27 minutes or so. I asked him for his list. So let's take a year, look at yours right down the middle. If you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, you can see this. Bedard, number one. Fantilli, number two. Dvorsky, number three. Carlson, number four. Leonard at five. Will Smith at six. Reinbacker at seven. Benson, eight. Michkov, nine. And Boot, ten. All right, Kyle said that Connor Bedard, in his opinion, his draft year, at the same age, is the best prospect since Connor McDavid, and he said that he had Connor probably um, a percentage or 5% or whatever it was uh, above Connor Bedard. Bigger, stronger, faster. Where do you rank Connor Bedard in terms of the best talents you've seen go in the draft in the last couple of decades? Yeah, I think he's in the discussion with with Crosby and and McDavid. You know, uh, I don't hear NHL scouts that I that I deal with say franchise player too often and. And they are saying it for him. Um, I was thinking about it today. You know, how would you describe him if you, if you wanted to compare him to an NHL players? And it, you know, uh, kind of like a Patrick Kane with uh, Brett Hull's release and Adam Moat's vision. You know, that's the kind of a package you're looking at there. So uh, that's uh, that's pretty special. You know, he could be. Uh, I don't see him not being a. Uh, you know, a hundred point score annually. And um, it, it's funny, like it, I think out of, out of all the teams, you know, at the top, when I was looking at Anaheim would have been just a powerhouse. I think if they'd have got Bedard uh, and then Columbus is building a lot too. They have a lot of pieces there. I think Chicago is going to be the, the team that has the longest rebuild, to be honest with you, you know, he, he's, they're going to have to do it right and get some pieces. It may be a while, before they contend, they might be getting some more, a couple more top five picks in the next couple of drafts. And then imagine how good they'll be then. So yeah, it's going to be very interesting. You're right about that because they're going to, they're going to be at the bottom for the next several years, you would think. And uh, 
you know, uh, part of me, once once I saw that it wasn't going to be the Canadians and it was going to be between Anaheim and Chicago, um, I went with Chicago for just one reason, um, and that's Luke Richardson, because I'd, I'd like for Luke to be able to, you know, he's going to be in very, very good hands with Luke Richardson. But other than that, man, you know what, Chicago? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a bit of a, like, a, it's too bad that they got... Uh, you know that they they were the team that I think purposely tanked the most. You know, and uh, they didn't really get punished maybe as much as they should have with the Kyle Beach thing too. Yeah, no, you're good. right about that. Yeah, you're right Ooh, about that. You know, maybe they shouldn't even have had the first round pick this year. You know, <laughs> so uh, there's certainly that part of it where yeah. Okay. And I have uh, Mason McTavish is from you know. I played minor hockey in Pembroke and, and he grew up there and I know his dad well and uh, yeah. Valley connection. So I certainly was hoping, I was hoping that Anaheim would win it or, or Trevor and Columbus. So yeah. I was a little disappointed that it ended up being uh, Chicago, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yarmo kick a line in the GM of the Columbus blue jackets. We had a chance to see him on television when it, you know, they got the third pick overall and uh, he, I mean, he looked like he was going to a funeral. I mean, he was just absolutely devastated. He was distraught. By the yeah. way, okay, um, Kent Hughes had a chance to speak to members of the media, all right? When asked if they'll trade the fifth pick overall, I'd say it's highly unlikely, but I can't say it's impossible. All right. Then oh, yeah, you've got to keep all your options open, you know? Yeah. Could be to trade up, could be to trade down, could be to get a, you know get a piece that they think that they they really need but uh certainly i think there's five players that are th that i think are really good fits for the canadians at at five that and they're going to get obviously they're going to get one of them so yeah uh, staying put at five it isn't a bad consolation prize at all i think they're going to get a really good really good prospect let's bring back up the chart if we can and what i love about um, scouting and talking about young players with, with different people who do it for a living is that sometimes players are a consensus, like you obviously saw at number one. Sometimes they aren't. Sometimes there are players that will be in your top 10 that will not be in someone else's top 20 and vice versa, okay? You heard what Kyle Woodleaf had to say about Michkov. You know, besides the uh, he's in Russia, there's uncertainty, we don't know if he's going to come over. Um, he's under contract for several years. Let's just talk about the player right now, if we can, the talent, the long-term potential. Um, Kyle says, in his opinion, Michkov is a superior talent in the last 15 years or so to every number one pick overall with the exception of McDavid and Bedard, in his opinion. So I brought up Matthews and McKinnon's name. I brought up McKinnon, and he added Matthews' name, and he said he's in that category, but in his opinion, just a notch above them. Hmm. Your thoughts on Kyle's opinion of Michkov? Tell me when was the last time you had a chance to see him, Grant, and how many times you've seen him? Yeah, well, it, it's been, uh, you know, mostly it's been video with me and, uh, yeah. you know, obviously, um, uh, I, I mean, it, it's difficult to be that adamant about it, I think, considering that we didn't get to see him play uh, uh, any international hockey in the past, you know, 18 months or whatever it's been. Um, certainly, you know, the, he's he's got the dynamic skill to... Uh, I mean, if if I was doing my list based solely on talent, uh, and I'm not, I decided to, uh, you know, I made the decision this past week that I'm gonna I'm gonna make my list just like I did last year with Miris Nachenko, you know, further down than what his talent, you know, deserved to be, but because of the uncertainty, I don't know. I just, I really don't know that I could take a chance on even a talent as good as Michkov in the top five, just because of the, there's so much insert, uncertainty right now. And no, uh, you know, you're not going to have any say in his development. You, you're not going to get to talk to him, interview him. Um, you don't know. 
I mean, with the passing of his father being highly, highly suspicious, and I wonder, you know, whether he whether he even will be inclined to come over now. So uh, I, I ended up ranking him in Butte lower than where they would normally be on the list if I was just uh, ranking the hockey player. But yeah. I, uh, I, put, I, I put him down where I think, potentially uh because there's seven or eight guys that just w will help a hockey team next year you know uh within a year they're going to be helping the team and Michkov, it's at least three years it's funny you know like he, he's got more talent than kaprizov but there are a lot of similarities to carol kaprizov who is a you know 100 point scorer in the nhl right but yeah yeah uh i mean he was drafted eight years ago uh here give or take a year and uh minnesota's on their third gm since he was picked and uh they have not won a playoff round in those eight years so as great a player as he is it took five years for him to get over here you know they're already on their third gm by then and they haven't made the play i haven't won a playoff round since so yeah uh, is michikov gonna you know be a playoff an nhl playoff warrior it's hard to say based on not really getting to scout him in the past year, other than, you know, looking at video of some KHL games and, uh, but, but certainly he's top three talent wise, you know, um, oh, top two talent wise, yeah. but top three as a prospect in this draft class. I, I, you know, I just can't rank him there cause I couldn't pick him there. And Grant, by now, I think most people read the news or heard the news, but for those who aren't sure of, what happened when they heard you talking about Michkov's dad? It was over a month ago that his father, Andre, left his house that he had been renting with his son. And very unfortunately, he never came back. He was found dead. An investigation has been ongoing. The circumstances have not been able to be explained. We know yeah. that... Um, you know, that um, Russians have been threatened to not leave Russia, to not go play in the National Hockey League. And it has some people speculating that maybe his father's killing had something to do with a message that was sent. Obviously, that's not founded, uh, and it is pure speculation. Uh, Michkov is signed with SKA St. Petersburg in the KHL until 2026. What is it I read, Grant, that um, Nick Bobrov has ties to SK uh, St. Petersburg? Or, uh, he used to work for them, right? I don't actually know uh, his background that well, Tony. Okay. Uh, I, believe you know, he used to, I believe he used to work for them, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, people assume, well, because Nick Bobrov is the, uh, you know, assistant director of amateur scouting that they'll lean towards. And, and I think it might be the opposite, Tony, that he knows what, you know, he knows how toxic it is, uh, the relationship between the West and Russia better than anybody. And, uh, you know, uh, the fact that you can't, have any say in these guys development and and uh that's an important part of montreal uh the the, the new staff here is you know they want hands-on they want it they want they want to develop their kids and mold them to what they what they think will be a championship team uh i don't know you know the the assumption is that because he's russian that he's going to want the russian and it, it may it may be the opposite tony yeah, um, so Nick Bobrov uh, served as SK St. Petersburg Director of North American Scouting. And uh, his father um, still works for SK St. Petersburg. Yeah. All right, okay, so that, there you have it. That's it. All right, okay. Um, let's let's go back to your let's go back to your your draft list if we can. All right. Bedard at number one, Fantilli at number two. At one point, did you have Fantilli ahead of Bedard? And when did that change? And if so, I would imagine it changed right after the World Junior Tournament, correct? 
No, it was well before the World Series. Oh, Junior. really? Yeah. Okay. It was the first month of the season, Tony. Bedard uh, like was barely over a point a game. He was le- he was on the ice for about three or four. He he was not playing well. And I mean, I you know I, I wiped the slate clean at the start of the year, and I I go by what I'm seeing. Uh, Fantelli was yeah. on a pace to put up uh, you know points that hadn't been seen since Paul Korea in the early '90s. And Bedard's a five nine center that looked like a winger at the time. He was yeah. he wasn't checking his hat. Uh, but then you know. Uh, not long after uh, I put out my draft list, he got fired and he started to play, to compete away from the puck. And he, you know, he went on the tear from there on. And I mean, within, by the time I did my next draft ranking in November, he was back on top. But I mean, it, it's irrelevant what you, what your rankings are in November. I know you keep bringing it up, Tony, but it doesn't matter. You know, you, you, I could have had him 45th, you know, uh, in November and, no, no, you're, you know, no, you're, it, you're it, it, it matters. It matters at the end of the year. You know, my, yeah, no, no. like even this right list here, that. even this list here, Tony is not, that's not going to be my final list. There's still yeah. a lot more research and a lot more video to do. Yeah. I'm in the middle of talking with all of my NHL scout contacts for the last time and getting their input. And I put that into my list too. So yeah. uh, this is by no means my final list. Uh, I'm, over the next two weeks, three weeks, I'm going to ponder whether I, I'm going to wait till after the the combine to uh, to release my draft guide or not. We'll see, but uh, certainly that you know that list that you see there is not my final list. That's for sure. I, I hear you, and and so someone like yourself will probably come up with what about three lists per year type of thing, or or a couple of months into the season, a couple of months after that, and then basically probably pretty much around the combine or right after the combine, and that's it. And that's what you go with. I, I'm, I'm shaping my list weekly. Okay. Like I, uh, you know, I go on my website. If, if you have a draft uh, subscription, you, uh, you can check weekly. And as I see guys more and more, my list is ever evolving. Like I don't put out just a monthly list or a bi-monthly. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's being shaped almost daily as I go along. So it's kind of a neat thing about, about my rankings too. If you have a subscription, you can, uh, you know, you can follow along with, uh, I mean, guys dip, uh, fall, uh, uh, and it's the same with NHL lists. You'd be surprised, you know. You really have to be open-minded with your list and say, okay, well, you know, I last time I saw this guy, I obviously was, was off on him, mm-hmm. and you move him accordingly. Like, guys can move 10, 15 spots after if you see a guy again and you change your mind on him, and you can't be afraid to, to make those moves, you know. Uh, like Snake, you know, he he liked uh, Musty. Uh, I, I noticed, you know, he's stubborn, just like the rest of us. But he, you know, he kept them in his top six right to the end. You know, the U.S. team doesn't didn't even invite him to the to to the uh, under 18s. You know, they had him in in at the Helenka in the summer. Yeah, and they could have they could have invited, and they didn't want him. You know, which which. Uh, which is a red flag for me, you know, I, as much as uh, Musty has some, some good talent and potential, uh, there, there are issues with his, with his character that are going to see him, you know, I mean, Snake might not be wrong with him being a top 10 guy at the end of the day, but there's going to be a lot of maturing and, uh, you know, that, that's going to be needed to, he's going to need to figure out a few things before uh, he becomes the player that he has the potential to be. I hear you. All right, let's bring back up the list if we can. All right, Dvorsky. I know you were a fan at the World Juniors, and I would imagine you're even more of a fan after the under-18s. He impressed a lot. Like, you know, I have to tell you, I wondered, and and look, I'm going to tell you right now, folks, I'm no draft expert, okay? So anyone um, who claims to be that either works radio full-time or TV full-time or, or whatever, unless you're actually just do that and actually travel or watch tape, you know, you're so busy watching NHL games. You don't have a chance to see young players with the exception of big tournaments and, or talk to people. Yes. But I, I wondered about Dvorsky's ability to put up points. I do recognize the fact he's a great 200 foot player and he can contain players from putting up points. But any concerns that I had, I think were evaporated after what happened a couple of weeks ago, Grant. Yeah. And I think, you know, 
He was a 17 year old, like barely 17, really like 17 and a half playing at the world junior, a top line center role. Uh, he was asked to, uh, to try to shut down the Bedard line, the Cooley line, and he did an amazing job with it. Now, did he uh, get a lot of points on top of that? No, but, uh, you know, I mean, if you go back in history and look at a lot of uh, NHLers that became, you know, 100 point scorers, they didn't produce at 17 at the World Juniors. So, you know, I don't think you can put too, too much stock in him not showing a lot of uh, offensive production at, at the World Juniors at such a young age. But then, uh, as uh, as Kyle mentioned there, I, when I caught at the end of the his uh, interview, you know, it was his first time playing against his peers in uh, a couple of years. And the last time he did, he finished second to Michkov. He was ahead of Wright. He was ahead of uh, uh, Slavkovsky. All these guys that are a year older, he beat them. He had more points than them the last time that he played against his peers at, as a double underager at the at the under 18. So anytime he's, uh, you know, he's been on the big stage with, with players close to his own age, he's produced. And it's funny, like he went back to junior, I think he, he had something like 18 goals in his last 21 games of junior counting the, the under 18. So, you know, he, he did show, even though he didn't put up big stats in, in the all Svenskin this year that he, uh, Certainly against his own peer, his own age group, junior age players, he, he can produce. He's going to score a lot of goals. He's got a great shot. And I think what really impressed uh, scouts and myself that we did, weren't completely sure about was his uh, puck possession skills. He showed at, he, he showed at the uh, under-18s that he, he can really ha- you know, hang on to the puck and he's got really good hands to, to go with the power. So he can beat you in many ways offensively and I think that's very appealing because he's very good on face-offs he's very good defensively uh one scout was saying to me like he just doesn't have any flaws you know you you might say well the skating's not perfect but his skating is going to be fine at the NHL level I believe so I I think I just think he's a can't miss prospect that's going to be a second line center at the very least and that's uh that's such a valuable chip He, he you know he has yeah, he has the potential to be a first liner, but all day he can be a second line center. Kent Hughes, Montreal Canadiens GM, Kent Hughes. About forty-five minutes ago, we will draft the best player available based on long-term potential. So, not the best pick mm-hmm. at five right now, but the player that at the end of his career. We'll end up having a better career than anyone else that is selected either five or later. When you think potential, besides the obvious Bedard, you think who? Is there a name that comes to your mind when I say potential, long-term potential? Yeah, well, you know, if you read the tea leaves and you're wondering about it, you'd probably, you know, you might think Reinbacher. Uh you know, he's got all the tools to be a uh, top pairing defenseman. And that's such a, <laughs> there's been a, there's been a defenseman taken in the top five of every draft in the past uh, 25 years. And this may be the first year that one doesn't get taken, but there's a, there's a nice fit there for Montreal, right? Defenseman, big right defenseman. Uh, you know, when I, when you, you start looking at the depth chart, you, you kind of look at, uh, you know, Gouli and Mayu would be a nice pairing together I think and Hudson and Reinbacher I I love the you know I love the potential of that as the other top four pairing with the Canadians uh he you know he played 20 plus minutes a game against men in the Swiss league it's a heck of a pro league very fast and he uh, you know as a draft eligible defenseman fit right in there and and they did well in the playoffs too he's just uh He's just scratching the surface of his potential. And there's a lot of people think a lot of more more at cider, you know, just in the fact that, you know, big kid that played pro in his draft year and played a lot heavy minutes and showed that he could be a great one-on-one defender. And I, I really believe that he's 
he's in the mix for the Canadians. He's one of those five guys that I think they're going to be seriously considering at five. Yeah. All right. So Kent Hughes says, I have to believe if you're considering Michkov and another player that you deem very, very comparable in terms of talent and potential, then those factors are probably going to weigh him down. Um, when asked about Michkov, uh, once again, he ended up saying a little bit later on that, um, that um, you know, um, now that we know where we're picking, if we had won the lottery and we're picking absolutely number one, then we wouldn't have to dig into it at the same level of detail, but we are going to do that. All right. So he talked about Michkov and he talked about the circumstances. Um, I think Michkov is certainly a special case and will do our homework. Said it's not only about him being Russian and being under contract until 2026, but also digging into what kind of player he is. And uh, these are a bunch of quotes, which I'm getting from some of my uh, colleagues and members of the media, actually, who reported it on Twitter. So I, uh, I thank them. Marpin Basu is uh, is one, uh, and um, Eric Engels is another. And uh, anyway, there are uh, there are others. Priyanta Emrith as well. So I use some of your quotes that I was able to find here on social media. So thank you, Mary, very much for that. All right, okay. Um, back to your um your chart okay uh carlson at four leonard five smith six ryan backer seven benson eight michkov nine and boot ten what i find interesting about this list if i just want to take one quick look at kyle's list is he's got sandine pelica at six and you got Ryan Backer at seven. So obviously he believes that the defenseman that can come out of this draft is Sandine Pelica, and you believe that it's Ryan Backer. Tell me why, in your opinion, Ryan Backer over Sandine Pelica. Uh, prototypical size, um, but you know, a lot better, a lot better one-on-one -on -one defender. Um, he uh he, he's more competitive physical he, he you know you look at the playoffs tony there's not one defenseman five uh there's three defensemen i believe played playing in the final eight teams that is uh 511 or, or shorter and they're all 511 and none of them are, are prospering you know um Kel, you know people will always bring up kale mccarr and obviously you know he he's a notable exception but such a rare exception there's there's only one, I don't know, Kale McCarr. Um, Pelica, I think some people have been overrating his, his offensive capabilities. You know, he had that five-point game against Canada, which was, uh, you know, a, a power play fast there that things got out of hand and, and he had the big. And then he tried to do too much, I think, after that. It got a little too fancy and, uh, you know, um, I just – in talking with scouts and from what I've seen this year, I don't see him being a high end offensive defenseman. He's 5'11. Uh, I don't see him being an elite defensive defenseman. Great skater. You know, he's going to be a nice puck mover, nice transition defenseman. Probably, probably a play on a second pairing um, and maybe second power play, but I don't see him running an NHL power play. He wasn't even the power play guy on the Swedish team. They had him on the second unit. Uh, you know, a 5'11 defenseman that's not even on the top Swedish power play of the under 18s, that's not a top 10 guy for me. You know, he's, uh, I've got him in the 20s, to be honest, Tony. I think he's, uh, th there are lists that have him a little too overrated in, in my estimation. All right, speaking of lists, um, Bob McKenzie's list is a list that a lot of, obviously, uh, hockey people like to look at because uh, he goes around, he talks with a lot of scouts, as does everyone. Uh, but, of course, he's been in the business for a heck of a long time, and so uh, there's a lot of credibility there, for sure. And he has some players that I notice on your list and Simo Snake Boisvert's list, who's going to join us shortly. He's got them a lot lower than you do, so... Uh, the one player for you is Daniil Boot. Talk to me about him because I've been hearing more and more about him 
over the last little while, and we're we're th- the package is definitely there. We're talking about a um, an impressive package here. Oh yeah, he's uh, um, you know six five, uh, really good hands. Um, there's a lot of doc similarities, you know, um, but even more skilled, I think, than Kirby Doc. He, wow, who went number three in his draft year? Yeah, wow. yeah, no, no, no. He, uh, <laughs> uh, he great hands, really great hands. Uh, he can score very, sees the ice well. Like I think he has a better shot than Doc. Uh, he's bigger, and as the year went on, he really started to show a physical side in it, and especially in the playoffs, he was just a beast out there running over. You know, he was playing against Svechkov and guys that were first round draft picks, Chibrakov. Uh, you know, some really good high-end uh, kids that are 19, 20 years old playing in the in the junior, uh, they, they got sent back down, and he dominated against all these guys. Um, it, you know, uh, he, he's in the same boat as uh, as Michkov in that he's signed, I believe, till 2026. So, so there's that part of it. But, you know, uh, certainly he played he, – he's – I think he's ideally suited for the North American game if, if, and when he does come over. And if you, uh, you know, you can wait the three years or whatever it is before you see him, hopefully it's yeah. three years. Uh, he's just, he's going to step in and, uh, and contribute, I think in a top six role in a lot of ways, scoring, hitting, uh, just a big, big, huge power forward with skill. Yeah. And and if there are anybody, if there is anybody out there right now saying, oh, Grant, come on, don't get too excited. He's number 25 on Bob McKenzie's list. How good can he be? Well, I'll remind some of you that back in 2016, the last time we saw a package like that was Tage Thompson. He went 26th overall in the draft, mm-hmm. and he's coming off a 47 goal, 47 assist, 94-point season after scoring 38 goals and 68 points the year before. So when Grant talks to you about a big package who can explode, I think he's thinking about Tage Thompson, who did just that. Yeah, well, there. yeah, that's not a bad comparable, Tony. Uh, an NHL scout that, uh, you know, about a month or so ago, he was watching some of Michikov's games, and he texted me and said, holy, you know, this guy's top five. Like he should, if, if he was... From Flin Flon, he'd be top five. You mean boots day. games, not Mitchkoff. You mean boots? Boot. Boot. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah no yeah, problem. Yeah. The bootster. And, uh, he, you know, he, he compared him to, to uh, Malkin. He said he reminds him of Malkin, uh, which, you know, uh, I mean, if he's anything close to, obviously he's not a center, I don't think, but, uh, you know, if he, anything close to that kind of skill package yeah. in the 6 5 body, you know, that that's. That's heavy, heady praise. So certainly, yeah, I think, uh, and, and and don't forget Bob's final list will be a, quite a bit different too. That, you You're know, right he, about that. Yeah. He comes out with his final rankings and, uh, yeah, you know, after NHL teams have all their meetings and after the combine and all that stuff, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Boots, Boots a little higher on his list at that point. I hear you. Grant, big show for us today, obviously, uh, you know, uh, a day that Montrealers are going to remember for a long time. It could have been better, obviously. But then again, it could have been worse because they could have dropped the sixth or dropped the seventh. As it turns out, they stayed put where they are with the fifth pick overall in the draft. Thanks for being a part of the show. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tony. All right. We'll talk to you soon. There you have it. Grant McCagg of Recruits and Recruits.ca. Let's bring in now. He's a uh, former scout with the Cape Breton Eagles and the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League and currently a consultant with Les Farrars de Val d'Or, Simo the Snake Boisvert. <laughs> guarda, du. Guarda, sta bellezza qua. Guarda, guarda. Oh! Hi, Tony. Comment ça va? Ça va très bien, toi? Good. Busy night for you at BPM Spa Radio. I think you were mm-hmm. on the air at around 7.30 earlier this evening. Yeah, from 7 till 9.20. Ah, oh, fantastic stuff. Thank yeah. you for actually making time to get off to speak with me. All right, okay. So I had a chance to speak with Kyle Woodleaf of the Red Line Report, former scout with the Nashville Predators. And, of course, you just heard Grant McCagg, former scout with the Montreal Canadiens during the Bob Ganey administration. Kyle right now is with the Red Line Report, of course. It's his publication, his agency, and Grant is with recruits and recruits.ca. 
That's his agency. You are a consultant with Le Farrar de Valdar. You've been scouting for uh, quite some time, and uh, you're you were the draft expert on BPM Spa. So now let's get to your list and let's bring it up. All right. As uh, I'm, I'm somewhat devastated and depressed that the Montreal Canadiens didn't win the lottery. Damn them for picking up points, and damn all those fans for saying, "Hey, baby, dis-moi ce qu'il faut." Energy cardio after they would score goals. <laughs> damn you, all of you. All right, Kyle Woodleaf had an interesting comment about Michkov. Um, and before I even tell you what he said, I'm going to ask you about him. I don't even think we have to say anything about Bedard at this point, right? He's the slam dunk number one, and most people seem to believe that he's the best prospect since Connor McDavid. Yes, but I don't think he'll be Connor McDavid either. Why? Uh... I, I don't think he has uh, the strength that McDavid has physically. He doesn't have the acceleration that McDavid has. You can and get strong. Able... You can get strong. Yeah, but look, uh, y- you can tell that at the same age, uh, McDavid was ahead of Bedard. And look, there's only one Connor McDavid. When I saw McDavid in 2013, 2014, I remember writing that I thought he was he could become the best player ever. That was my opinion from what I saw when he was 16, 17. Is he there yet? Uh, I think he's not far from being... I I think he has to pile up more seasons like this, but give it another seven, eight years, and I I think he'll be in the the conversation for best player ever, I think. Because you have to consider that right now... Okay, imagine Connor McDavid in the 80s. How he's many gonna points win the cup. get? Five, he's gonna 500? Have to win. He's going to have to win the cup. Yeah, You can't true. be in the conversation true. of the greatest of all time if you're not going to win a Stanley Cup. As as difficult as that is, and, and maybe as harsh as it is, it's just you can't. You can't. you got to win. I agree with you. I agree with you. He's going to have to win. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, Bedar, I see more like uh, the same impact as uh, Patrick Kane, Nikita Kucherov, which is fantastic. I mean, they both won Artras... Uh, they both won the Artras Trophy, and which I think Bedar will win one day. And they both won Stanley Cups. Yeah. But unfortunately for Bedar, in Chicago, there's a minimum, minimum six, seven years before they can become contender. Minimum Anaheim, six, seven years. To it. Anaheim, you would have been closer to it. Chicago, I mean, the, the, the team was totally destroyed. They even... Traded a 21-year-old guy last year for a draft. In Kirby game. Talk. But you know what? You yeah. know what the draft lottery showed us tonight? Yeah. Intentionally tanking works. The um, Chicago Blackhawks management team basically did what they had to do, made the moves they had to do to basically put forward a tank job and give themselves the best chance of winning the lottery. And in the end, the team they ice finished third worst in the National Hockey League, but they were fortunate to win the lottery. And I believe Connor Bedard will win the Stanley Cup with the Chicago Blackhawks. And, you know, I, he's going to win it. I don't know when, but he'll win it. Like, Connor McDavid's going to win a Stanley Cup too. I don't know when, but I believe he'll win yeah. it. I, I, uh, I, I, I share your opinion. It's just that it's going to take time. But, uh, yeah, if they surround him with uh, good young players and yeah. add the good mix at the end, yeah, you could see Bedar lifting the cup maybe in the early 2030s. All right. What if, let's look, you know, it's, let's fast forward here. Tonight is not May 8th. Tonight is June 28th or whatever the day is. I think it's the 28th of draft. Mm. It's a Wednesday in Nashville. Starts at 7 p.m. Eastern. And the Canadians, they're on the clock, the fifth pick. And Michkov has not been drafted yet. And you're sitting at that table. You're sitting in between Kent Hughes and Jeff Gorton. Are you going to talk or are you just going to look at me? What are you going to say? Are you just going to look at them too or what? No, no. I'm going to tell them run to the podium and choose Mitch Goff before time runs out. You're going to tell them run to the podium? Yeah. 
you're going to run with them. Oh, yeah. You're already going to have the Montreal Canadiens jersey with Michkov on the back. Yes. With a number five for the fifth pick. Yeah. Why? Because at that point, you know, if they if they pick second, let's say, although I have Mitch Cobb second, you can make a case for Fantilli because Fantilli is going to be in the NHL next year. He could have an impact very quickly. He's a big centerman. Mitch Cobb is a smaller winger. You 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 can make a case for Fantilli for 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 going second. Let's say you're the Montreal Canadiens, and I yeah probably would take Fantilli with the second overall pick had they won the lottery, the second lottery, but. Come number five, okay, Bedar will be gone. We presume that Carson will be gone. But hold Fenty on a second. Let, hold gone. on a second. Let, let's bring up the chart one more time. Yeah. So I asked you today, give me your top 10. Your top 10. Not not what you think teams are going to do. No. I asked you for your top 10. You have Bedar at one. You have Michkov at two. Yeah. Now you just told me if I had to pick second, I'd probably still pick Fantilli. But you're trying to confuse me or what? You're you're rattling me now. Okay, yeah. It, it, when, 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 in Lide. No, it's because when I come up with a list like this, I just uh -huh. base it on talent, what I see on the ice. Then sometimes, and it happens in yeah. uh, in, in the real drafts. In okay, real draft. I've been at the draft table in the queue where sometimes we would pick a guy who was lower on our list for X, Y, Z reasons, before a guy was higher on our list. You're never supposed so I, to do that. Hold on a second. You know what you're, t you're telling me? Yeah. You're telling me that if you're preparing for a hockey pool, okay? You're preparing for a hockey pool. Let's just say, okay? You're doing a hockey pool. And you have McDavid 1 on your pool, right? And you have, uh, you, prepare a, a, you prepare a cheat list for yourself, right? And you mm -hmm. have Dreisaitl at number two. And you have uh, Kucherov at number three, and you have Matthews at number four, and at number five you have uh, Pasternak. All right, you're telling me that if you have the second pick, you're not going. You're going to disregard that you have Drysaitel at two on your list. You're going to disregard three and four, and you're going to take Pasternak at five. It makes no sense. What are you? What are you talking about? Okay, first of all, you're talking about a hockey pool. Okay. Okay, and second of all, even in hockey pools. When yeah. you get to the fourth, fifth round, you yeah. might have a guy higher, but you know that your buddies have never heard of this guy. So you might wait a little bit later to pick him. You wait, you, know you wait, you wait to pick that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you but wait. this is hockey pool stuff. What I'm saying is that yeah, let's I'm, talk just, now. Let's talk. I'm just basing it on talent. talent. If I look at talent, if yeah. I look at future impact, I prefer Michkov. But you have three years of Fantilli before you get to Michkov. That's to be considered. And especially it's, it's, depending it's on what kind of team you If have. Michkov will come back in, in 2026 or yeah. if there's a chance of getting him out of there earlier. Now, uh, it also depends. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, and I understand. And of course, he plays center ice. He plays center ice. Yeah. And then there's, uh, but there's the other thing though, and, and that is, um, do you think you'll be a cup contender in the next two, three years? In Montreal? No. No. So you might so as well. Why, why would you? Why, why would you bother? And we're talking number five here. We're why talking number you, five. Yeah, but let's let's say at number five, the yeah. guy you're going to take obviously is not going to be a star next year. He might not even be on the team. So then you have two years of the, uh, with this guy. The yeah. first year he's a rookie. So yeah, the okay, third year he might start helping you. The guy you choose at number five, Michkov arrives the year later. Why not pick yeah. uh, pick Michkov? Okay, so what does Michkov have? Talk to me about him because Michkov. Kyle Woodleaf Michkov. made a comment about Michkov, which I'll tell you in about a minute, the comment that he made. But talk to me about what kind of talent we're talking about here. We're talking about a guy who's just a notch below Connor Bedard overall in terms of uh, playmaking, in terms of shot, in terms of hands, in terms of uh, knowing to be like in the right place. I, I, I see a star winger in Michkov. Mm -hmm. Who does he remind so, you of? To me, he's just a notch below Bedard in terms of talent. Down, Bedard has a better shot, and he, he, he's just, I would say, like he's slightly better in terms of you know stick handling and everything. But Michkov is a guy who would have gone number one in my book in many other years, and especially had he been had he played in the CHL. 
So you put Michkov last year, he would have been number one. You put Michkov in 2020, he would have been number one. Uh, not 2020, 2021, he would have been number one. So you know what? That's basically, um, that's basically what Kyle Woodleaf said. Kyle Woodleaf said that if he takes a look at the NHL draft going all the way back to 2015, for example, okay? He takes a look at the draft going back to 2015. Connor McDavid was the number one pick in that draft. He said Connor McDavid could beat up Michkov as the number one pick, and Connor Bedard will beat up Michkov as the number one pick on his list. But any other year since Connor McDavid's 2015 draft year, he thinks Michkov is the number one pick. Uh, th that's quite a statement because even I wouldn't go as far as saying that. Really, eh? Yeah, because he I would have picked, said more I, I so, more so I would have picked Kale McCarr. I would have picked Kale McCarr before in 2017. Yeah, but in 2017, Kale McCarr went number four. You would no, have drafted you're in 2017. You would have, we're, you, we're talking about my list. My list, you, I had McCarr at number one. Oh, you had number one on, on your list. Yeah, I had McCarr at number one in 2017. Who is it? Who was better than you? Nobody. You said it. That's a. Uh, that's that's. You know why you can make a case that Kale McCarr is a top three player in hockey. Yeah, and you know what? I had Stutzla at number one in twenty twenty. That took I had guts. Of Alexi Lafreniere. Yeah, that took a lot of guts because you know what? Uh, I, I I got pretty roughed up on the social media after saying that. Well, because you're uh, you're a gentleman from the province of Quebec who's not going with a player from the province of Quebec as number one. So you're that's you're obviously taking heat because yeah. Les Gouts Chez Nous are supposed to protect and push for Les Gouts Chez Nous. And when one doesn't, people get upset. Yeah, I guess that's what it is. But also because he was really the consensus number one. I, I, I don't think many NHL teams didn't have him at number one. We'll never know. But that's my guess. All right. Back to your list. Yeah. Fantilli at three. Yeah. You talked about him. Leo Carlson, talk to me about him. Okay. First of all, after number three, to me, there's a big drop. Leo oh, really? Carlson. Big yeah. drop. In my book, there is a huge drop. After so you three. have Bedard in a category of his own. Michkov in a second category. Fantilli in a third category, and then there's a fourth category with others. I would say, uh, I would say two and three are in, yeah, yeah. Let's say three categories, yeah. Three categories. Then, so so Connor Bernard is uh, is one A. Michkov is one B. Fantilli is two A, and now you have a two B category. Oh, I, I have a, a three four category. To me, okay. there, there's a big big drop after those three. Hold on a second. Now, weren't they saying that this is one of the deepest uh, drafts in the, in the history of hockey uh, in top the same three. conversation as 2003? No. Top three is fantastic. But then, after uh, uh, starting at number four, to me, it's a draft like any other. So we're going nowhere without an umbrella with the fifth pick overall then. My night was already bad when yes, I saw no, they were picking yes, no. fifth. You just ruined no. everything. No, 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 no. I had Tony. even a little bit of hope. Now you just you no. killed me. Tony, like in any year, there will be some very good players coming out of the draft after the top three. The only thing is, there will be busts, there will be players who are that disappointing, and there will be players who are very good. The only problem is, when you pick five, six, seven, eight, it's much harder to identify this guy. because And, and, and this is very tricky for scouts, because let's say you pick five, okay, and you pick a certain player. And the guy who's picked number six or number seven becomes a superstar. Then what do people say? So you can never win. As a scout, you can never win. And, and, and this, is, this is the problem with drafts overall, and especially this draft. I, I, I read somewhere at some point there are 10 franchise players in this draft. I said, what? Look, we, we, we'll revisit the, 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 the top 10 in five, six years. And you'll see, it'll be, in my book, a regular draft. 
like any other draft. There will be a couple of disappointing players, a okay. couple of very good players, et cetera. So et cetera. Based, based on what you just said. Yeah. Okay. Go back to your list for a second. Mm -hmm. If Bedard goes one and Michkov goes two and Fantilli goes three and Carlson goes four, and you're Kent Hughes, and you have that number five pick. Are you trading it? Yeah. And Mozi too, Mo. Yeah. Wow. What? I don't wow. trade it for a thirty-year-old veteran. I try. I try and did. I try and do what he did with the thirteen pick last year. He got th Kirby Doc for a thirteen pick, but obviously okay. we're looking for someone better than Doc with the fifth. Okay. Pick, obviously, but I would trade it. If a team is willing to trade a young player, a 20-year-old player, let's say, or a 21-year-old player who, who, who is on the way up, I trade the number five pick. If, Give me names. Okay, you ready? Look, Alexi I, I don't get into that type of speculation. I don't think about these things. Okay, I'll ask. You don't have to speculate okay, nothing. If, I'll if, ask. If you, if you ask, I'll play the game. Okay, let's play the game. Yeah. The Rangers call you. Yeah. You can't use. They want your fifth pick. They offer the kid from Saint Eustache, Alexi Lafreniere. Does the conversation last long? You stay on the phone. You hang up the phone. What do you? You tell me you call them no. back. I say no. I, I I try to get a better offer. You try and get a better offer than that. Yeah, I don't think Lafreniere is worth the number five pick. What if they offer you Keandre Miller? I like him. Je l'aime lui. Keandre Miller. Let's just say that uh, we're, we're talking. I don't know if no, I no say yes. parlela. Now we're yeah. talking. No we're talking. Andrew Miller, we're talking. Okay, now we're talking. All right, okay. Yeah. So we're talking. We have a conversation with the New York Rangers, and we're talking about Keandre Miller. Okay, now all of a sudden, Cheval Dayoff calls, and he says, Pierre-Luc Dubois has told us that he wants to play for the Montreal Canadiens. He, by the way, is from St. Agathe de Mont. Played in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League for an organization that you know well, the Cape Breton Screaming Eagles. And then in his final year, he was traded to Blainville, Boisbriand, Armada, who made it to the final, but they were swept in the final. And it wasn't a good final for him, but it was a good playoff. By the way, were you working for the Cape Breton Screaming Eagles when he was there for three years? No, I just left the year before and went to Valdor. Oh, you went to, okay. Yeah. Should the Canadians go after Pierre Luc Dubois? I just that's it. I'm just asking you right away. That's no. it. No. Why? Contract. Future contract. Because he's going to make eight million. You don't think he's going to be worth it? Exactly. Any other reason? No. Well, the fact that uh, the guy doesn't play, uh, you, you know, he doesn't play uh, 82 games a year. If you know what I mean, in terms of effort. Yeah. I, I think it's very up and down. Sometimes he looks one like one of the top players in the NHL, and then he disappears. But other than that, considering the the, the contract, the monster contract that he's gonna Kovalev was like that, but he said that he used to pace himself. That was what he used to say. I'm pacing myself. Yeah, well, uh, that's fine. That's fine as long as you you show you you show in the playoffs that you did pace yourself during okay. the regular season. Dubois didn't this year. Dubois Have you seen? Are you saying that when it comes to Dubois, there are some red flags in your opinion? Yes. And the main one being the future contract vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis the, 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 the production, you know, or the type of player he will be. If he, if he asks like for eight times eight. Yeah. Like really, what does this contract become in a few years when you're close to being a contender and you need salary cap space, or and or you need a spot for a young player. You're really, really stuck with, with a with an eight times in player who's like I don't know, 32 years old, 33 years old, and and uh, this is a guy who probably would be very frustrating for fans. So my answer is no. Okay, um, you said that you would um, for good young players, you'd have the conversation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who can I think of here? Because um, I'd rather have a 20-year-old who's on the way up 
and perhaps the team has given up on him or he, perhaps he, he doesn't get a chance, you know, because obviously the Rangers are gonna are not going to trade Keandre Miller. It was a very good example that you gave me. But at the same time, I don't think he would be available for the number five pick. Although sometimes you never know. I mean, okay. uh, the, the Hawks traded the Brinkat for the seven pick. Okay. Uh, let's just say um, Quinn Hughes. <laughs> yeah, uh, fifth pick and more. If, if they want more, I'm willing to give more. You're a fan, eh? Yeah, I'm a fan. Uh, and also, I think he, he's exactly what the Canadians need. The Canadians, they have a lot of good, potentially good, let's say, young defensemen, but they don't have that quarterback. They don't have that that puck mover. They don't have that rover, because I think Quinn Hughes is a rover, really. Uh, he's not really a defenseman. He's a rover. But they especially need okay, that. Okay, can Lane side. Hudson end up being that rover? Not sure yet. But you like probably with Lane Hudson, though. You're, you're not the president of the Lane Hudson fan club. You haven't been since his draft year, I don't think. Hey? Look, I'm just, I'm just saying that he, 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 he doesn't have Quinn Hughes skating. He doesn't have his mobility. He, and yeah, he's a good puck handler and everything. Got lots of points in the NCAA, albeit, you know, against weak opposition most of the time. But uh, I'm, I'm still, I, I'm, I still have a question mark over Lane Hudson. I didn't have a question mark over Quinn Hughes. All right. Is there a young player? We're having this discussion. Is there a young player that comes to mind that you really, you watch him and you say, man, if I could get my hands on that player, I would. Because you just said that if you're Kent Hughes, you would trade the fifth pick overall. Well, I would you have would to do so because you have to be realistic in the sense that you have to think of a young player that a team would be ready to trade. You know, I don't think, let's say, the Blues would trade Robert Thomas, for example. Yeah, or Jordan Cairo. Or Jordan Cairo. Or uh, the Devils wouldn't trade uh, Nico Ischier, you know, so... Or, or Jesper Bratt. Yeah, exactly. So you, you have to think of a guy uh, that perhaps a team is willing to trade because either they're rebuilding or either they have new management and the guy maybe doesn't fit. You know, Quinn Hughes. I, I don't think the Canucks are going to trade him, but Quinn Hughes, I think, is perhaps maybe more realistic, let's say, than uh, an Nico Ischier or, uh, you know, uh, Jesper Bratt. You're a fan of Andrei Zvechnikov? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he went second overall in the draft, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would trade the fifth pick for him. I'm not sure Carolina would accept. Is there a goalie that you've identified in this draft? No. No. All right, back no, to your I'm, list. I'm waiting for Gabriel Degg in uh, in three years. Yes, I know you're the uh, the president of Gabriel Degg fan club. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Real deal, eh? Oh yeah. All right, love no, this look, guy. Love look this at the guy. Way. He's amazing. Look at the way he's smiling. All right, let's bring up the list one more time. <laughs> okay, on this list, there are a couple of players that most NHL experts don't have where you have them. Yeah. Musty. And Perot are the two type, the two guys that I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Musty, like for example, Bob McKenzie has him 26th on his list. Yeah. 26th. Okay. Look, I, I can understand why Perot is not that high. Perot's 23rd. Musty, I don't understand. I really don't understand. I think the, the these guys are. These NHL scouts, whatever the anybody who makes a list who doesn't have Musty High on his list, is is basically fast asleep or on some kind of drugs. Whoa! Whoa! He's wow. the sleeper of the draft, Tony. He's the sleeper. This is a guy who's going to be picked probably in the twenties, and he's going to be a star. He's going to be a star. Yeah, well, star, not superstar, but he's going to be a star. A star Quentin is, is a, star. a star is a uh, thirty-five goals, seventy points. Yeah, exactly. He's going to be a star. Uh, that's the range where I see him. Yeah, 30, 35 goals, 70, 75 points. Yeah. Wow. So why do you think everyone's sleeping on this guy then? For the same reason that they, they uh, Macar didn't go number one. For the same reason they thought Lafreniere was the next, uh, uh, you know, uh, superstar? 
I don't know. I don't know. You ask them. You ask these people who make these lists and who work for NHL teams. I don't know. I don't want to pick their brain. I'd rather pick mine. <laughs> Quentin Musty, you threw out his name like three months ago. Yeah. I said, this guy, this guy, forget about it. This guy's not all there. And three months later, you throw back out his name again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, more than ever. I'm going to buy I, I like the way he finished the season. I really like the way he finished the season. How did he finish the season? Tell me, how did he finish it? Well, look, the guy, first of all, and I'm not big on stats, but y y you still have to talk about it. The guy had 1.5 uh, a a point per game average in the best junior league in the world, the Ontario League. Okay, he was injured. Had he not been injured, he, would, he was on a pace to score 100 points. Not many 17-year-old players score 100 points in the Ontario Hockey League. He's six foot two. He's 200 pounds. Uh, he, has, he has good hockey sense. He's a decent skater. He's tough. Uh, but you're telling me he's going to be the steal of the draft. You're telling me he's a deep, decent skater. He better be better than that. No, he doesn't he, skate very well, my friend. He's, he's no. not picking up 70, 75 points. I'll tell he's you that right okay, now. He, he, Look, he's an okay skater. Um, it, it's just that he's not, he doesn't fly on the ice. That's all I'm saying. But he's not a bad skater. He's not clunky or anything. He's an okay skater. But the strength is once he gets to the offensive zone, this guy is a lethal weapon. When he comes into, when he does a zone entry, you can see this big guy coming in and he's just 17. And you can only dream of what he's going to do in the NHL. This is going to be a tough cookie who scores goals. Rick Nash was like that, but Rick Nash can skate and Rick Nash went number one yeah. overall. Yeah. Well, Musty uh, wouldn't wouldn't go number one overall in my book. You know, I don't have him number one overall. No, I'm just saying he's the he's the sleeper of the draft. He's the give sleeper of the draft. Give me, give me Musty before all these names. You know, Dvorsky and all these guys. You know, Musty uh, before basically. Dvorsky. What? Musty before Dvorsky. Yeah, yeah, and because Dvorsky is a big question mark. It's a bigger. You, you see this guy playing, and you're like, oh, okay. And then you know, they they these guys. Don't forget Tony. The U18, okay, in yeah. terms of evaluating players for the future, yeah, it's worth zero. And Mozi too now. Are you serious or what when you say these it's things? What do you mean? Player, it's just 17 year old playing together playing together. Who cares? You want to see a 17 year old against 18, 19, 20 year old players. Like at the world juniors. Yeah. But at the world juniors, unfortunately, the 17 year old guys usually they don't play a lot. But or or they're not on the was not pretty on good at the anyway. World Juniors, was he not? Pardon me? Dvorsky was pretty good at the World Juniors. He was okay. He was okay. I don't know. Man. But I don't see this guy as big as some other talent evaluators see him. So if you're Kent Hughes. I don't take Dvorsky. And I have the fifth pick overall. You have the fifth pick overall. I do and everything somebody, with my power. And somebody, trading. never mind even getting a good player, but somebody offers you to trade the pick for two picks, and the two picks yeah. you could end up having could be like 15 and 25. You would do that because you could end up getting musty there. You know what? Uh, 15 and 25, I don't know. I think the fifth pick is worth more than that. There, I'm sure there's a chart like in the NFL, you know, for these I things. understand, but, you know, if you yeah. have must be at eighth on your list, between five and eight, there's not much, you know. No, you said 15 and 25. No, no, but what I'm trying to tell you is, what I'm trying to tell you is, you have must be at number eight on your list, correct? Six. And he's, on, he's at six? Let me bring back he's up the chart. Six. He's at six. Let's bring back up the chart. Hmm. Holy... You have him at uh, you have him at six. Yeah, you have Musty at six. Yeah. Wow. So what I'm saying is, you have the fifth pick. If somebody offers you two picks in exchange for that fifth pick, worst picks, you would do it because you know as well as I do 
that Quentin Musty is not going in the top 15. You know that, right? Exactly. So then you would do it. You would trade your fifth pick for 15 and 25, for example. You would do that. I tried to get uh, I would try to get better than 15 and 25, but let's say for argument's sake, yeah, because I know I could get Musty at 15. 25, I think it's risky, but uh, he's, because I think he's going to go probably between, I see him go probably between 18 and 22, 23. That's my guess, but it's just a guess. I, I'm speechless. You know, you know that this, when you go live like this, yeah, and there are 1,132 people watching right now on YouTube. Yeah. Not to mention Facebook, 1,137 now. Not to mention Twitter. This is basically going in a library where it's going to be available to everyone like for forever. I know. And you just said that Quinton Musty is the sleeper of the draft. And yeah. anyone who doesn't have him in their top 10, when they put together their lists, they're on something. Yeah. They're on what? What, this, what exactly? This is a guy you will outperform his uh, uh, selection. He's going to outperform his selection. Yeah. yeah. Like, basically, if he's drafted 19, he's going to be much better than, than the 19 best player in the draft, if you see my point. If he's yes, drafted. I understand what you're trying to say. Pardon me? I understand what you're trying to say. Yeah. He's going to be, uh, when it's all said and done, he's going to be a top 10 player in this draft. But he's not going to be selected in the top 10. So to me, that's what I call a sleeper. You're the Montreal Canadiens. You want to take the next step this offseason. You make any moves? Yeah. Yeah, and this is going to surprise you because... I'm no, 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 with just... you, nothing surprises me anymore. Yeah. Don't worry, but listen to me. You don't have to say it's going to surprise me. Okay. Nothing surprises me anymore. I'll tell you what I think. Hey, tell the me. Have a lot I of can't wait for it. Hold on a second. Let me get ready. Let me yeah. sit back in my gamer chair here. I have a feeling I'm going to pass out. Maybe because I'm doing intermittent fasting or whatever it is. I don't know. Okay, go. Yeah. Let me take some okay. water here. The Habs, they have a lot of prospects. Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily elite ones, but they have a nice long list of guys that seem to excite some stuff, uh, some uh, some uh, scouts, you know. They have, and, they have guys that, in, in many people's opinions, can hit doubles. Yeah. Me, I think that, first of all, there's not going to be any room for, you know, uh, room for all of them, first of all. Okay, and who are you trading? All, You're trading somebody. So basically, I'm clearing the deck. Mitsuga, here we go. But what I'm trying to get is what, and, and, and I would have done it had it been uh, uh, Kent Hughes, especially considering what the return was. Huh. When a guy like Timo Meyer, who age 25, 26, is available. Yes. You trade prospects for this guy. Look at what New Jersey gave for him. Not necessarily. Yeah. Not necessarily because... You got to understand something. Between you and I, where do you think Kent Hughes wanted to finish this year? Oh, I agree. But I'm talking this summer. Yeah, but this summer. But I understand. But oh, Meyer okay. Let's say trace for him in, 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 in March. Look, it's just the last 15, 20 games. I mean, what, what would it have He changed? was traded. He was traded from San Jose to New Jersey. If the Montreal yeah. Canadiens were going to make that deal, Timo Meyer was going to help the Montreal yeah. Canadiens win games. For 15, 20 games. And Kent Hughes would not want that because okay. he would want to finish. I don't think it was... Look, it didn't change anything. You know, it's a lottery. Okay. It's not about finishing 32nd. It's a lottery. Huh. They didn't win yeah. the lottery. Okay. So what I'm saying is that. I think there are opportunities right now because there are too many teams who are tanking. There are too many teams right now. So tanking might not be. And I will, I'll, I've always been a fan of tanking. But as long as you're, you're the only team or one of two teams doing it. Now there's a list. There's a list of teams tanking. No kidding, because everyone wanted Bedard. Yeah, but then they're yeah, but now it's like it's but sort we of wanted to build a right culture, now. so we used to pick up those those stupid points. No, but it's it, it, it's, culture. A, it's a fad, it's a copycat league, you know. 
So yeah. now, oh, oh, let's demolish and 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 rebuild. In yeah. the meantime, some of these things like Chicago last year, and you know, yeah. to an extent, um, Kent Hughes did it. He got Kirby Doc. Okay, yeah. there are teams right now who are getting rid of 25 and under players yeah. just because they want to tank. I think the Habs, with all the pro so-called prospects well, that they Chicago have, got rid of the Brink and they got rid of Kirby Doc. But once again, exactly. they did it because they wanted Bedard. They're smart, and everyone else is stupid. Look, there's still going to be teams tanking in the next few years, Tony. Now is the time to get those players, those 25, 24 year old guys. That teams are, are 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 trading for absolutely no reason except the fact that when the rebuild is over, these guys are going to be thirty or okay. thirty-one. You know, they're trying to build a core so, uh, exactly the same age. So where where are we going? Here? You're going you're going around 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 no, no, I'm not around going around around, I'm around, you around. Pick, Tony. Pick any any prospect right you're now. You're the that kind of guy that happy. goes on his honeymoon. He leaves her there. He doesn't touch anybody. Yeah. What's my? Can we get to the point okay. here? What? Will you let me finish? Go ahead. <laughs> what I would do if I were you, I would try and see the 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 23, 24, 25, 26 year old players that are available, established, and I would trade prospects for them. I wouldn't trade prospects for 30-year-old players, but I would try and get those, the Brinkats, those Kirby Docs, which they did, uh, those Timo Myers, that team want to get rid of before they reach free agency mm. and they don't want to give them eight, nine million a year. That, well, there's a problem. There's a what problem. Is the problem. You know what it is? Yeah. The problem is if you make a deal and you go after the Brinkat, you got to pay him $8 million a year. But yeah. you didn't get that one yet. You have to pay him $8 million okay. a year. When you get rid of those prospects, those prospects are an entry-level contracts. They're making less than a million dollars. How okay, are you going to okay. be able to pull this off? Time Tony, out. Tony, I'm talk a lot of these prospects, either there won't be any room for them on the team or they will become suspects very quickly. Okay, I think the Habs pool in terms of quantity is is it, it, it has quantity but i'm not sure it has that much quality okay you're you're dying to throw out a name there i can tell you're 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 chopping you're you're hold on a second i can tell that you believe that some montreal canadians fans over evaluate some of their prospects i can tell that you're thinking this so now i'm gonna ask you give me names oh. who are prospects that, in your opinion, are not as good as some of the Montreal Canadiens fan base believe they are or believe they will be? Logan Mayu. And Mozi too, now. What do you mean? Is, you don't think Logan Mayu is as good as what people think he is? No. He's big. He's strong. He skates like the wind. He can quarterback a power play. He shoots the puck through a wall. He's got hands for a defenseman. I saw him score a Michigan goal. Who? Which defenseman is better than him right now in the OHL? He's 20 Who? years old in junior hockey. Who cares? And Mozitumo. <laughs> Who cares? He's 20 oh. years old in junior hockey. Yeah. Who cares what he does? I know they're going to go to the Memorial Cup, perhaps. And now you're going to see... All these fans getting excited during Memorial Cup week. Oh, Logan Mayu, best defenseman in, in the CHL right now. Who yeah. cares? He's 20 and, years old. <laughs> and, Kale Mac and Kale McCarr wasn't 20 years old when he was playing at UMass. Kale McCarr was 18 years old in his draft year. This is what matters. After the draft year, if the guy stays in the same caliber of play, who cares? I stop following him. I want to see him at the next level. I want to see Mayu in Laval next year. Th this is the next step. The 17-year-old season, the 20-year-old season in the HL, those are the important season. The 18, 19-year-old seasons, when they go back to junior, ça vaut ça. Okay, I, I understand. I understand your point. I mm. get it. Mm. But um, you still got to do it, man. If 53 points in 59 games, score 25 goals for a defensive. 17 cares? points in 15 playoff games. Who cares? So, in your opinion, your answer to that is he's supposed to dominate. He's yeah. he's a yeah. twenty year old in his fourth year yeah. of junior hockey. Exactly. 
you know what you didn't mention though, eh? You know what you didn't mention? What? Is think of all the hockey that this guy missed. This guy had a full season this year. How many games did he play last year? I know. And he I, played 12 and, games and last COVID year. Season. He missed the COVID season. I know yeah. all this. But Tony, he's 20 years old in junior And the year hockey. before, he, he ended up playing... Um, Michael McCarron w- w- was at the Memorial Cup when he was 20. And everybody was partying, thinking of, uh, of oh, the Canadians finally have their big uh, centerman. Or big Michael winger, McCarron, or Michael, with all due respect to Michael McCarron, he couldn't skate. You know it and I know it. Ah. They drafted him by no, need. Well, let's go back to what Not people were saying in the Memorial Cup. Let's go back to what people were saying. I had bets with friends, you know, Yeah, who thought that he was going to be a second liner, you know. I even bet he wasn't going to be a fourth, it wasn't even going to be a fourth liner. You realize that it's it's very unfair what you said about Mayu. He's okay. a 20 year old and four years of junior hockey and all that stuff. Yeah. What's the date today? Uh, it's the maybe- 8th of May. Yeah, I asked him what's the date. He's unsure. Okay, May eighth. You, you you think I memorize dates? You know, like this. Well, it's the yeah. NHL draft lottery. You have to remember this date, May eighth. Okay. Okay. He turned twenty years old. Like, I don't know, three weeks ago. Yeah. So, it's his final year in his nineteenth year, not in okay, his. Okay, it's his nineteen-year-old season. Fine. And but, and but, but Tony Tony and he only played twelve had... games the year before, and the year before was a COVID year. I mean, let's be okay. let's be fair here. Okay, the, the, a guy who's built like him, okay, yeah. will often dominate in junior hockey because he's bigger than the other guys. Once Correct. he reaches the NHL, I mean, it's he, 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 he's on a uh, you know everybody's equal in the NHL. He's not going to dominate with his physique. So you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't I would have taken the guy. If someone wants him and I'm, I, I can get something, even like a, a late first round pick, go okay. out. Would you trade Slavkowski? That's an interesting question. Because uh, you know, I, I don't think his value is, is, is at its peak right now because of the injury. Uh Look, that's. I think that's a very, very hypothetical question. Uh, no, but what you just said about Mayu when you talked about somebody bigger being bigger and stronger than his peers, yeah. well, maybe that would explain some of the success that he had last year. Mind you, he was able to do it at the World Championships and do it at the Olympics yeah. as a seventeen-year-old. Yeah, going up I, I don't think we can put Slavkovsky in the same conversation as Mayu. All right, I, okay, I think so- Mayu in my book, Mayu in my book is a mediocre player. And uh, he, he's going to be a, a tweener between the AHL and uh, the third pairing in the NHL. He's going to be a tweener for the rest of his career? Probably. Or uh, best case scenario, third no, pairing. No, 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 no. You... Best case scenario. Look, I respect everyone's opinions, but uh... <laughs> you didn't you sleep much last night. Having... We're having fun, and maybe in five years you can make fun of me if Mayu is on the first power play and, and, and he gets 20 goals. Maybe in five years. I have a feeling I'm going to make fun of you every day for the next five years. Oh, okay. No problem. Wow. Okay, who else? This is fun. Hey, this is really fun. Yeah. Who else? By the way, Vegas is beating Edmonton 4-1 right now. There's uh, three minutes to go in period number two, and I have the under seven goals, and I really don't like my uh, – I really don't like the way it's looking right now. Which other Montreal Canadiens prospect do you think their fan base is highly overrated? Other than Logan Mayu. Oh, just pull out any top 10 list and throw Five it in one there. Five-one now. Five-one now. Vegas, just, yeah. Just take any top 10 list and throw it in there. They're all overrated, in my opinion. Sean Farrell? Well, depends on what overrated means. If people see him as a, a, a top, six, top six guy, maybe that's overrated. Is Caulfield no, still considered a prospect to you, or no? You don't have him no, in that category. No, 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 no. No, no, he's no, all right. Yeah, no, yeah. Prospects to me, uh, it's uh, guys like uh, well, we named Mayu, we named uh, Farrell, uh, Lynn Hudson. Yeah, uh, Lynn Hudson. I would, I, 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 if someone makes me an offer right away, I trade the guy before his his value starts going down. Over at Tewalio. 
for you. Even after the season that he had. Wow. Kyle Woodleaf told me, and everyone's got an opinion, and I respect yours, but Kyle Weave told, uh, Woodleaf told me that Lane Hudson last year, if he was two inches taller and 20 pounds heavier, he would have had him going in the top three. Yeah, but he's, he, he, he's not, he was not two inches taller and 20 pounds uh, bigger. That's that's my point, Tony. No, no, but he got he got two inches taller. 20 pounds, yeah, I don't is. know, but he, he gained two inches since he was He's driving. still not a great skater for his, for his size. For his size, he's not a great skater. For his size, yeah, but you know, I, I understand that. But uh, Quinton Musty is not a great skater either. But you told me he's going to be a star in the National Hockey League. I yeah, think because he's a winger. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a two hundred pound winger. He's a two hundred pound winger. You know, we're co comparing apples with apples. Lane yeah. Hudson's role in the NHL will be Quinn's, Quinn Hughes's role in Vancouver, technically. I understand. In order for Lane Hudson to become a Queen Hughes, he has to, to be as mobile and as good a skater as Queen Hughes. If he's not, he certainly ain't going to be a defensive defenseman. He's not going to be Owen Power or, uh, or, or you know, uh, any of these, uh, or even uh, Caden Gooley. You see my point? Owen Beck, overrated, yes or no? Depends on how you see him. How do you see him? Uh, third line shutdown. Sentiment. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Maximum 50 points. Oof. Maybe more like 40. Oof. What do you mean? Oof. Max 40. Max 40. Max 40? Riley Max Kidney. 40. Oh. Uh, uh, Laval. Future Rocket uh, player. No NHL for him. No. Joshua Roy. Bottom six uh, is his ceiling in the NHL. He's not quick bottom enough. Six. Yeah, he's not quick enough. That's if he makes it. If he makes it, bottom six. If he makes it. Yeah, <clears throat> bottom six. Because I don't know if he would be a good fit on the bottom six. Because he's an offensive player. The only thing is, uh, I'm not sure he has the quickness to, to be a, a top six player in the NHL. Goes pretty Philip fast. Philip Meshar. Who? Meshar. Very disappointing this year in uh, the OHL, considering. Uh, look, I, I would wait a little bit. You'd wait, but, yeah. Uh, I would wait a little bit, but if someone wants him in a trade, I, 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 I trade him. You trade him too. You're basically yeah. somebody who's trading everybody, basically. You have no Pretty patience much. for anybody. Uh, no, because I, I, I think that right now, most of these prospects' value will never be as high ha as it is today. Jaden Struble. Oh, Laval, trade, out. No. Out. AHLer, -A AHLer. AHLer. Yeah. Jordan Harris. Jordan Harris, NHLer, uh, worth keeping unless you get like a, a nice offer. Like he could be packaged in a trade to get, since he's an NHLer already, he could be packaged in a trade for, let's say, like I mentioned, you know, a Timo Meyer, for example. Yeah. Do the Canadians have any prospects that you like? I'm just curious, but are, are you, uh, are you upset with the, the Montreal Canadiens uh, scouts or management team? That uh, are you upset or anything, or are you upset I, at them, or, or just? Uh... Well, look, it's. No, I'm not. I'm not upset at anybody. No, no, uh, no, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just find, I just find that these guys and I, we don't share the same. We don't like the same type of player. We Thank every God. time I look at the Habs draft, yeah. and you, you know when they're about to select, I think who would I take? Yeah. It's very very rare that I, I get the same guy. Very rare. It's happened before, but it's very rare. Okay. But we'll have you know we'll know in a few years. But so far in the early 2010s, uh, I, I was quite right. You know about lots of players. You know. Forsberg before Galchenyuk, stuff like that. 
Yeah, Forsberg before Galchenik would have been good. Galchenik was drafted yeah. third. I believe Forsberg was drafted, what, 11th, 12th? 11th, yeah. I had Forsberg. 11th. Yeah. So, it, 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 like I Morgan say... Morgan Riley would have been good, too, at number five. Pardon me? Morgan Riley would have been good, too, at number five. Yeah, Morgan Riley, too. Yeah. So, look... But uh, one year, I, I, I think you had Nechushkin at one, did you not? Yeah, yeah, look... I had him McKinnon, no? I, I, I saw a monster. And you know what? You saw a little bit of that monster in the playoffs last year. You but saw a musty. You saw a musty. A musty. You saw Quinton Musty. No, I thought Nishushkin was going to be a, a megastar. I thought Nishushkin was the next Malkin. Wow. Yeah. That Eve, you know what? Good for you for admitting it happens. Yeah. But look, I, I, and I'm not... I'd rather uh, be wrong than not have an opinion at all. You and know what and I mean? I'm not looking for excuses, Tony, but if you saw Nishushkin last year in the playoffs, he, he was close to being uh, the, the Conn Smite winner. Yes, Very I know, close. but somebody doing something for a short period of time... I know, I know. ...doing it all the time for 80 games, I know, I agree. that's all the I difference agree. in the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. McKinnon has been good for 10 years, so... Uh, you know. No, no, of course, of course. I'm not debating this. You know, I, I'm just explaining my reasoning at the time. That's yeah. Fine. Yeah, I know. You know, I know a couple of people do a couple of good podcasts per year. It's like it's not enough. Like, <laughs> yeah. you got to do it all the time. Yeah, or as often as possible. Yeah, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So tonight, basically, and we're gonna end it with this: you can't use. You didn't go forward. You didn't go backward. You stayed with the fifth pick. You would entertain a trade. You would, unless. Mishkov is still around. And if Mishkov is still around, you would look at him and you would say, run to the podium. Run, Forrest, run. Yeah. With Mishkov, the name on the back of the jersey. You wait for him for three years. When he gets to the NHL in three years, you get your uh, Kaprizov, let's say, you know, for the sake of comparison. Yes. You, because Mishkov, whenever he arrives to the NHL, he, he's probably going to be Rookie of the Year. But in 2026, there's a guy who's better than Connor Bedard who's arriving. Gavin McKenna. Remember this name. Gavin, Gavin McKenna. McKenna will be a better prospect than Connor Bedard. In three years, we're going to be doing the show and we're going to be drooling over Gavin McKenna. Hopefully, you stop drooling over Quentin Musty by then. Look, Quentin Musty, I, 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 I'm drooling for. Uh, uh, it's a sleeper. A sleeper. I, I didn't yeah. say he was going to be a superstar. Don't put words in my mouth, Tony. No, no, you didn't uh, say a superstar. You said he'd be a star. Yeah, a, a 30, 35 goal scorer. G uh, Gavin McKenna is between McDavid and Bedard. Okay, he's a tiny, tiny little notch. Below Connor McDavid. You know they're cousins, eh? Yeah, Bedard and McKenna, yeah. yeah. Bedard and McKenna are cousins. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? I, I just, I can't, I, I can't put myself out there. I, I'm not going to pretend to know much about him, but Connor Bedard, with two years left still that he could play for Canada at the World Juniors, <laughs> Already scored more goals and picked up more points than anyone. Yeah. And was the best player at the tournament at 17 more so than 20-year-olds. Yeah. And played on a team that had several older players and was so much better than everyone else, it wasn't even funny. I'm not going there. I agree. But at least there's bloodlines here, right? They're related. But McKenna will be better than Bedard. Because he's better than Bedard was at the same age. McKenna played some games in the WHL this year at the age of 14. Yeah, he was the first overall pick for Medicine Hat. Yeah. And at he, the, got he, a, he was got 14 years status. old when the season started. 14. And there were games, or at least shifts, where we, he was the best player on the ice. I saw I saw every shift that he played this year in the WHL. I watched all of them. He's 15 years old, eh? Yeah, now he's 15. He's going to be playing full-time next year for Medicine Hat. And trust me, I'm going to watch every one of his shifts in the next three years. 
So I'll say this. If in three years, the Montreal Canadiens don't take the next step, do what Chicago did. Yeah. Give yourself a chance at Gavin McKenna. Yeah. But I hate the lottery. You hate the lottery, eh? Oh, yeah. You finish last, you get number the first pick. NFL style. Well, Baseball yes and no. As a lottery now. Oh, okay. So hold on a second. So in your world, you finish last, you get the first pick? That's what you would yeah. do? Yeah. Yeah, but then everyone's going to try and tank. They're trying to avoid tanking, even though teams do it anyway. Yeah, but who cares? Who cares if teams tank? They, they can do whatever they want. It's the product they want to sell. If, if they want empty stadiums, that's their problem. This What was a lot mean? of fun. We usually go weeknights at 10 p.m. and we end at 11 p.m. It's usually a one-hour podcast. We went on early tonight at 8 p.m. We've been advertising it since uh, four or five days ago. And we're ending the podcast just past 10.30 p.m. I want to thank you. You and I, you know, we like to uh, poke fun at each other. Yeah. We both have our opinions. I'm going to bug you with Quinton Musty for the rest of time, hopefully. Good. And I hope that Logan Mayu proves you wrong. Fine with me. From Fine now on, I'm going to call you Simo the Snake wants to trade every hab Boisvert. Thanks for doing it, Simo. I appreciate it. Salut, Tony. Merci beaucoup. C'est très apprécié. Hein? There you have it. Simo the Snake Boisvert. Marinero. Can't use. On the circumstances surrounding drafting Madve Michkov. Now that we know where we're picking, if we had won the lottery and we're picking absolutely number one, then we wouldn't have had to dig into any of the same level of detail. But now we're going to do that. What kind of player will you draft? Can't use. We will draft the best player available based on long-term potential. What kind of player is Michkov? Can't use. I think Michkov is certainly a special case and will do all our homework. Are you going to trade the fifth pick overall? Kent Hughes, I'd say it's highly unlikely, but I can't say it's impossible. The Montreal Canadiens will pick fifth. San Jose will pick fourth. Columbus will pick third. Anaheim will pick second. And the team that tried to tank so that they can have the best shot of getting the number one pick, the Chicago Blackhawks, who traded away the Brinkett, traded away Doc, and right before the deadline traded Patrick Kane, they won the lottery. And the only guy I'm happy for right now is Luke Richardson. It was supposed to be one of the best days in Montreal Canadiens history. But no, we had to build a culture. And all of you fans who are cheering with every win, hey, hey, baby, how do you feel now? I'm a little bit down, but tomorrow the sun will rise again. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 p.m. the way we usually are, and I'll be in for the rest of the week, and that includes Friday. Special thanks to Energy Transportation Group, Mike Cinquino and Sean Gerard. Special thanks to the Geloso Beverage Group, distributors of La Bitta TV. Aldo Geloso, and Ted Farace. And special thanks to Excel Moto, Ali, and Vito. Check them out at excelmoto.com. In my opinion, the number one place to buy a Piaggio or Vespa scooter. I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. Tell all your friends about it. Thought it was a pretty sick show. And by the way, we're going to have many more of these special shows, this, that, Agnello and Sammy and I and Juliana, we're already brainstorming as to what we're going to do next season. And we have some ideas to finish off this season. This podcast is going to get more and more sick every day. And this sick army, this sick community that you are, is going to get bigger and stronger. And together, we're going to rule the podcast world. We are Montreal Sports. We are Montreal's podcast. We are your number one Montreal Canadiens podcast in the world. If you think the same, 
Leave us a five-star review on Google, Apple, or Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, like it, share with your friends, and comment sick, S-I-C-K, S-I-C-K, S-I-C-K. For Agnello and Sammy, the Cavalaros at Master Control, I'm Marinaro. It's a sick podcast. Talk to you tomorrow, 10 p.m. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinaro on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. <laughs>